This is the superintendent's only opportunity to uh, open an official board meeting, and I'm going to do so by announcing the new chairman of the board, Loretta Pond. Thank you, Dr. Pelletier. Uh, we'll begin tonight uh, by introducing our new board member who is joining us tonight for the first time. This is Charles Greer, who was elected at the most recent uh, school board election, and we welcome you. We're very happy to have you join us. Thank you. You. Uh, this evening, the first thing we're going to do is not the first thing that's on your agenda. Uh, this will be the time that we will formally sign the teacher contract um, with Mr. Don Richards. Would you like to come forward, please? Uh, members of the board and Madam Chairman, uh, on behalf of the association, before we sign the contract for the ensuing two years, I'd just like to thank you and Mr. Leslie and the members of the board um, for considering all of the issues that the Education Association brought to you, to you and uh, let you know that our committee enjoyed working with you in the settlement for the contract, and we look forward to two years of good relationships. Thank so thank you very much. Peter? Okay, Don, Loretta and I and uh, all the members of the board would uh, also like to thank you and your very capable negotiating team. Uh, I think that uh, in these negotiations, we, once we got them started, went through them about as rapidly as uh, anybody ever has, from what I've heard. And I think that one of the major reasons for that is that when we made all of our points and observations, you and your team listen to them carefully in a calm and reasonable way. And Loretta and I certainly tried to do the same thing, and I hope we succeeded. And I think the fact that we are signing a contract tonight uh, indicated, indicates that we did indeed succeed in doing that. And I think that we, uh, as we sign this contract tonight, we probably have the highest paid teachers in the state of Maine. Uh, so we have, I think, that to be very proud of. I think it shows the community's commitment to, to education and to uh, attracting and remunerating uh, uh, good teachers. And so I hope that uh, you and the members of your team and, and all the teachers are going into the summer vacation with a good feeling about this because we certainly do and, and are, and want to thank you for your part in it. Thank you. Um, do you want, do I come up there to yes, do this? Yes, please okay. do. It's the last page of both. We're also uh, signing the contract for the, uh, the custodial staff, and uh, Mr. Holt may have a few words he to say about that. Well, it's the first time I've been able to sit in the room and, and negotiate a contract with uh, any group of employees, and I'd like to say that uh, as Don was the leader of the group that we met with, the negotiations were handled in a very professional 
very forthright, and I think a, a very uh, interesting session. And I think a lot of things have come out of the negotiations that are very positive, and I believe that the negotiations with the bus drivers and the uh, and this, uh, maintenance staff, the custodians, is a good contract and one that they're very pleased with. Uh, I think the vote was almost unanimous when the vote was taken, so uh, I look forward to uh, a good two years with uh, an important part of the school system uh, being on board with the new contract. Thank you, John. Uh, at this time, I will turn the meeting over to our superintendent, Dr. Pelletier. Madam Chairperson, I'm going to ask uh, to make one change in the agenda. That uh, if you would call on the report of the fourth grade assessment scores to come first, uh, unless there are high school representatives here tonight. I don't see them. Yes, so we are there new. Should we, Madam Chairman, should we hear the children first and then? Have That'd be them? fine. Right? I'm sure you have finals to study for, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me to look at it. Okay, there's there's not a lot really to tell you. The only thing we're really looking forward to, us non-seniors anyhow, is, is summer vacation. So um, this week, this past week has been exam week. Um, Thursday will be class day where awards are handed out, things like that. And then Friday, of course, will be graduation. Um, the only athletic team still going in competition is the boys' baseball team. <coughs> and they're competing right now in the Western Maine playoffs. So hopefully they'll, they'll succeed as usual. Um, one other thing I would like to tell you, just um, we did have our student council election June 2nd, and for next year, myself and Jen Hayden, who will be a junior next year also, will be the school board representatives in this position next year. So that's about it. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Peter. Have a nice summer. Uh, and now at this time... We'll have the... Uh, Mr. Kramer is with us to make our report on the fourth grade assessment scores. Mr. Kramer. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to make my report so I can get off to another important meeting as well. Um, as usual, if it's okay with the board, what I would like to do is briefly touch on the highlights of the uh, main State Assessment Report. Uh, you folks have received a copy of this, and uh, I'm assuming that you folks are pretty familiar with this now. If there are any questions as I go through this, feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask any questions as I proceed through this. Um, these are the results of a test that was taken in the end of January. So uh, this is not a test that was given just recently. It uh, was taken actually in mid-year. It takes a while for these reports to come back because uh, there are three sections that are hand scored and that takes a long time to do that. So the, uh, the turnover of the scores is, is relatively slow. Uh, if you go to page three. Page three basically outlines the numbers of students who were tested. Uh, in our school, there are only three students who were excluded because of significant handicaps. That means that 97 percent of our student population actually completed the tests and scores are included in this report. That compares to 93 percent across the state. So. Uh, we have a significant number more, or a significant number of students who take the test, uh, a much higher percentage, really, than uh, the state average. If you go to page five, <clears throat> page five breaks down each of the subtests of reading, writing, math, science, social studies, and humanities into four quartiles. And it this chart presents the number of students and the percentage of students from this school who scored in each one of the quartiles. We historically, and this year, have a, a roughly close to half of our students actually st scoring in the top quartile. There are interesting variations as you look at the different uh, quartiles and the different subtests. Those are up and down somewhat from past years. Uh, again, you can review those on your own if you, unless you have any questions, I'll uh, go on to the 
the next part, which is the really the most important part of the report, and this gives our scores. <coughs> in reading, for instance, if you look into the, the reading horizontal column there, you will notice that in reading, our students scored 335 on a scale of 1 to 400. If you look to the right, there are bar graphs there. And those bar graphs indicate the scores of schools that would score, where schools would be expected to score, who are comparable to Cape Elizabeth as far as different uh, socioeconomic conditions are concerned. And if you're wondering what those particular conditions are, you can go back to page five, and you'll notice that, as, that those are compiled by looking at home resources, community occupations, and the number of students who receive free or reduced hot lunch. Uh, in all cases, we scored above our expected score band. Going to the other specific scores, the writing score was 330, the mathematics score was 365, science 325, social studies 330, and humanities was 325. Most of the scores improved from last year. There are a couple that didn't, and a couple stayed about the same. The, uh, the next two pages, pages 9 and 10, give you very specific subtests within the subtests. Um, where our students score relatively high, there's a pretty consistent band scoring at a high level. There are one or two areas where our students didn't do as well as we might expect. As you'll notice under physical sciences, force and motion was one, and uh, higher order applications of science was an area where we did not score equal to uh, the average for Cape Elizabeth. If you go over to pages 12 and 13, they look at the school-wide scores <coughs> in relation to some various kinds of variables. Uh, the first one that's listed is the scores of boys and girls, and I think that this year is probably the first indication that, we've, that I've seen of such a significant gender gap uh, at the fourth grade level. There's a roughly 100 points difference between the boys and the girls scores in writing, with the girls scoring about 100 points higher. And in science, the boys outscore the girls by about 100 points. Uh, 50 points is considered a significant difference in score here. So you can see that a 100 point score is, is a, it's a pretty sizable difference in the scores. One of the, the other things that I'd like to point out is the uh, identified hap handicapping condition uh, comparison shows our students with a handicap, handicapping condition score very, very well. The score of that group is equal to many scores of various schools across the state. And in the writing area, for instance, it's 10 points above the average. So our, this year, our students who receive special services did an exceptionally good job. Um, that was a very, uh, just a very quick review because I know you folks have probably a long agenda tonight. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to address any questions that you have. Are there questions from the board? Jan? Well, in the reading, I, I know there's been some concern um, that the score is slightly down from two years ago. Is that considered, it was 370 in 1986-87, 340 last year, and 335 this year. Is that a significant number? I think it's approaching significance. And uh, the 
the pattern would cause a little concern for me because it's a continued four-year decline. Most of the other scores have gone up and down. Some have gone down one year, but they've come back another year. That's the one area where uh, it's gone down for four years running. Do you have any reason for that? I have seen other times in this school system and other schools where the, the minute you get away from a pretty standard text or basal approach, test scores of this kind tend to go down. Mm -hmm. And I've made that from my personal observation and working with test scores for a long period of time. I don't know of any research that indicates why that should happen, but I, my suspicion is that this test really doesn't measure the objectives of some non-basal, non-textbook approaches to reading. One of the uh, things that I noticed, um, I got a copy of the test and, and looked through it, was that if, if you have a program that really stresses trying to look at things in different ways and come up with lots of different ideas rather than one right answer, this test would be more difficult because there were, there really were more than one, there was more, more than one answer that, that could be well explained by a child as to why they marked it. And I thought perhaps that might be one reason that, that we are focusing on lots of, on critical thinking and lots of different ways of, of looking at things. And this test doesn't measure uh, that as far as I could tell. Right. Um, That's a factor. Another factor that is, that is true of this test and all of the subtests. The test as a whole is a very difficult test, I think. And one of the things that they've found at the state level is that the schools across the state tend to cluster and group towards the middle. So what happens is if a school moves a little bit in one direction or the other in terms of number of correct answers, your score is going to go up and down pretty significantly because the, there's not the range of movement for, cor for uh, correct answers getting you uh, I'm not saying that very well. You know, when, when you have a non-based test and most of the correct answers are clustered in a narrow range in the middle, you see, when a school system or an individual gets a few more questions right, the score goes up very quickly. When you miss just a very few questions, the score comes down pretty quickly. Thank you. Um, so I, that can be another factor that's entering into it. I yeah, I, I wondered how many, how many wrong answers it took to really lower a score. And I didn't see anything in the test that, was, um, that were basic kinds of facts that, that kids should know that, that they're not getting. I mean, it wasn't like um, every sentence starts with a capital letter and, and those kinds of things. Those were not asked in the test. So I don't see basic pieces of information that, that the kids aren't getting. So right, there's an inordinate amount of questions that get at higher level thinking skills. And uh, they, they ask just a few compared to most, I think, commercially produced mm -hmm. standardized achievement tests that have many more basic questions that test facts within the uh, passages that are, that are to be read. In this particular test, as you say, kids not only have to read well and comprehend, but they have to go two or three steps beyond that, make interpretations. And, and sometimes come to conclusions that aren't very easy to come to mm -hmm. and discuss it with a few parents. And, and uh, some of us have agreed that as adults, we'd have a pretty difficult time coming to the, arriving at the correct answer. Mm -hmm. And these are fourth graders that are taking this test. It's a real challenging test in that sense. I guess, Lyle, the concern that I had, and, I, and I'm sure that the, the rest of the board has the same thing, is the gender gap. Uh, what, if you look at the scores, and unfortunately the people here at home don't have them in front of them, but the state scores, um, if you were to compare ours, <coughs> pardon me, you have a 223 for boys in writing, a 279, so you have approximately a 50 point gap there. And in science you have a 286 for boys and a 240 for, for girls and about a, approximately um, 50 points again thereabouts. Uh, again, you would call that significantly uh, or st statistically valid uh, difference. We're looking at 100 points difference in those areas. Uh, that should signal a problem somewhere or an opportunity 
let's rephrase that uh, to, to address these things. And I guess the question is, where do we where do we go with this information now that we have this? How do we rectify the situation and adjust? Well, if we were looking at again a continuing trend, I'd be much more concerned than a situation where we've not seen this kind of pattern in the past three years. So this is the first year that this gap has shown up with any degree of significance in a consistent way. Um, so that I wouldn't do a, my inclination is to not do a lot based on one year's scores. If this is a similar pattern next year, then yes, I think we should take a very close look at that. But what were the numbers the last time the test was taken? What, what, do you remember that? I'd have to go back. The difference? I don't have that. I can get it for you for, for next meeting if you'd like. Might be interesting. In those areas of under skill area where we, we seem to score a little lower under physical sciences, is it because those are areas that the students at fourth grade have not been exposed to force and motion and application in high order? I don't know. I'd have to go back and take a look at the curriculum, and I can't tell you that right now. Again, I, that's another... You know, that's another question that I can certainly check out and have for you. Because in the other three areas, energy, matter, knowledge, and comprehension, they seem to have scored relatively well. One of the things that happens whenever you get into a very specific subtest, you have to understand, is that um, there, are be, there are so many subtests there that you get a relatively small number of questions that are asked in any one area. So just a few questions missed here and there, again, will will cause those scores to go up and down pretty significantly. I'm, I'm surprised that we each year we tend to get such a precise pattern uh, that's, that has f very few variations. Ms. Sullen? Um, what do the teachers do with this information from, that they get from the test? Do, do they um, use it for, for next year when they're looking at the curricula? Or what, what happens with this? We use it to a limited extent for curriculum review. Um, as you folks recall, last spring when our <laughs> scores um, went down for a short period of time there, uh, we had a special school board meeting and and took a pretty close look at the whole testing pattern and looked at possible causes and possible remediation to, to uh, take care of some of those issues. Um, we do that as, as different questions come up. For instance, if the gender gap continues to stay as it is this year, we certainly would take a look at that as a, as a, as a school. Um, if, the, if, the thing, if that same thing happened in any other area, we would do that. But as I say, our scores have been relatively consistent over the four-year span. Uh, we do not, I would like to emphasize this, I think, we do not use these for placement. Uh, we don't uh, use these scores to keep kids in or out of any classes or anything like that. Um, I think that one of the more useful purposes is for parents to look at the three subtests that, that they do receive reports from. I think that's important, too, to keep in mind uh, the purpose that these tests were developed for, and that was basically, uh, these tests were de basically developed to help the governor and the state legislature to make very broad educational policy des decisions at the legislative level. This is why they're given at only three grade levels at uh, four, eight, and 11, so that uh, the state legislature and the <coughs> policy, educational policy makers can get some handle on where schools as a whole are performing. Uh, I think that it's, it's uh, that you have to use these tests as uh, just an adjunct to provide, that provides more information to uh, teachers and parents, uh, along with other SRA scores that uh, that are received at the other grade levels from grades three through eight. 
and uh, keep those in as a check against grades and something to discuss at parent conferences. Uh, so they used in that sense. They are not, uh, we haven't, uh, I can't say that we've brought in or excluded any program based on these test scores and, and really shouldn't based on just the test scores. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Pelletier? Well, uh, you've uh, been looking at these tests for a number of years. A number of the superintendents, particularly in the southern area, are uh, a little concerned uh, that uh, the test is designed uh, are not in line with the more modern curriculum that uh, lighthouse schools are adopting. And uh, we're concerned that money has been appropriated to review the assessment, which was done how many years ago? What is this? The assessment design was done about five years ago? Yeah. Because it's been in effect for four years now, so it's probably yeah. six to seven years ago. And we're starting to see, uh, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, we're starting to see that uh, the hands-on curriculum, such as the math that we're, most of us are going into, uh, will be penalized on how the tests are assessed. And uh, a number of the superintendents feel that uh, this is creating a problem because by the time the money is appropriated and the assessments are reassessed, uh, some of us are going to be going one way and the assessment is going to go another. And, and uh, can you substantiate any of that in the state? Well, I'm familiar with some other schools because these, these scores are published year, uh, yearly in the newspaper. Uh, by the way, I don't think that the newspaper publication re relating to these scores have come out yet. Um, <coughs> but some of your nationally recognized school of excellence and some of the schools that are perceived to be the best in some cases have, relatively speaking, some of the lower scores based on what you would expect those schools to produce. Um, the other thing that, that happens comes through in uh, some of the questionnaire reports. Now that I wasn't going to bring this up, but now that you, you asked the question, if you look on page 13, one of their own questions on the questionnaire demonstrates that to some extent, certainly. The question is how often do you use hand-on materials in math? <coughs> and for the students who responded statewide, this is not for Cape Elizabeth, for the, but for the students who responded statewide, never, it included 23%, their average score was 242. If they responded that they used those a few times a year, it went up to 283. <coughs> they used them a few times a month. That group, which was 23% of the kids in the state, scored 278. If they responded, a few times a week, it came back to the equivalent score of never using them, and if they use them almost every day, it drops down to 208. So, uh, I think that that... I think, I think that, sir, you made our point very well. <laughs> that is exactly what the superintendents are talking about. That's yeah. exactly it, and I think we should alert the public and the boards that as we move toward excellence, the state is going to have to catch up with us. I, I got to say, just interject here, that I don't understand that point. Last night, I took the fourth grade test home, and I did all 50 questions in math. Um, pretty tough test, incidentally. And I cannot conceive of a better math program turning out kids that can't pass this test. I mean, three times three times four is still 36, no matter how it's taught. What, what's the answer? I mean, how could this happen? How could it go from 242 to 208 in a, in a more modern, theoretically better teaching system? 
Well, I don't know, but I suspect is uh, if you trade chips and learn everything about mathematics, then you're not going to produce what they, the multiple scale tables. Uh, I don't know how <coughs> obsolete the assessment is, but uh, the facts are there, and we're quite concerned, and uh, I think we should watch it very carefully. Otherwise, and I think the legislature uh, realizes it because that's they're hopefully going to appropriate enough money to review the assessment. Are you going to come back in eight years and tell us that that's the reason our SAT scores have gone down? I don't know. <laughs> okay, just I, I, I think we, it's, it's important that we make the point because we should watch this carefully as we move along here. Again, um, in a similar fashion, I'm not saying that there's a direct one-on-one -on -one correlation, and this is not any kind of scientific statement at all, but just from a pragmatic overview of test scores. I've seen over the years teachers, for instance, who may teach math at the same grade level. Uh, some of the very strong math teachers who, who interest kids, increase the motivation, and do a real good job teaching math. As a matter of fact, strong, they're strong enough so that they can leave the textbook some, and uh, the students perform very well. Don't get the kind of scores on a test as some, some teachers who don't have the kind of credentials, don't have the experience, and have to fall back on the crutch of using the text on a very regular <coughs> daily basis. Those, the, the test scores for the kids in those rooms uh, oftentimes do better than a much stronger math teacher. Now, I, I can't say, I can't tell you why. Well, if, if, if the MEA doesn't test what we're teaching, is there a program out there that does give us some sort of an evaluation of the program that we've taken on and, and whether or not it's... I think Michael really wants to say something. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> what gave you that idea? Um, let me show you another results on the, on the math. <coughs> on a, if I can find it here. <coughs> on page nine. Okay, the bottom analysis there where it says. Uh, Procedural, our kids scored 340. Uh, conceptual, 340. Problem solving, 365. Okay? And then if you look over at the diagram and you look at those error brackets, uh, if the error brackets don't overlap, then the difference is not due to standard error of measure, so it looks like it's a significant difference. Okay? Are you following? So it looks like our kids are in problem solving significantly better than in procedural or conceptual understanding, which is an impossible result. Because in order to solve the problems, the kid needs to understand the concept raised by the problem and needs the procedural steps in order to solve it. So it shouldn't be. Yeah, are you following yeah. the inconsistency there? Yeah. Now that's, whenever you see something that doesn't make any sense, that's very interesting. Um, and I think part of what happens is, uh, you know, three times three times four is, I would pretty much call that a procedural problem. If you, if you attach it as one of the procedures you need to use in order to solve a problem, then, then the child not only needs to know that procedure, but needs to understand that the concept involved in that problem is multiplication, and then they need to carry it all out. Okay, so it's like at least three steps in order to do the problem solving. One of the problems with uh, the SRAs is that it tends to be a, a test that's basically procedural. And what we're shooting for in all of our new curriculum development is curriculum that's going to get more integrated with kids' lives, get more into critical thinking skills, and get more <coughs> into uh, problem solving. Okay, now in order, to, in order to get there, 
Yeah, absolutely. The kids need to know the procedure. Yeah, if, if the kid can't do the procedure, they can't solve the problem. But one of, the, one of what we're moving towards in, in all of these new programs then is programs that, that have us get beyond the procedural and into the meat of what you use those procedures for so the kids can really do higher level thinking with those procedures. So what we need is a test that is heavy on critical thinking and on problem solving and a piece of that test needs to be the procedural stuff. One way to understand an impossible result like this is that our kids have the procedures but when you ask them a problem that gets them interested they get better with the procedures. If you just give them the procedural stuff they make, they make silly mistakes, but you give them a problem that's more interesting and all of a sudden they multiply correctly. Maybe that's the answer to, to a result here that doesn't make any sense, but that struck me when I looked at that. Um, I, I, like, I like the main assessment. It's one of the only tests around where the kids actually do writing and the state goes to enormous lengths, enormous difficulty in scoring actual writing samples for every fourth grader in the entire state. It's, it's just a mammoth undertaking. It's a wonderful thing that they do. Um, what I'm hoping to do next year is uh, start at the beginning of the year and, and do the job of see whether we can find uh, some kind of normalized test uh, that really gets to higher level thinking skills to, for possible replacement of the SRAs, which will more closely match the kind of goals we're really after now. Okay? I, I, we're, that's, a, that's one of the jobs that uh, I think I'm setting for myself and, and for all the people who will be involved with that for next year is to see whether we could find a test like that. If we could find a test like that, we'll uh, end up with a test where our students don't top out. If, if you remember, our kids are one and a half, two standard deviations above the norm on the SRAs, which means that our kids are topping out on the test. It's not showing some how strong some of those kids are because there's no room to differentiate them. Uh, we tend to top out a little on this test too, I think. But if we can come up with this test, uh, if we could find it, and it may not be there, but, but maybe even if it's, maybe if we never find the perfect instrument, we'll, we'll at least find something that's an improvement on the SRAs. Yeah. I think some people are concerned that when we move into hands-on math that in some classrooms it's done to such a degree that the basic skills are neglected. Can you address um, that? Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised that a classroom that uses hands-on materials of virtually every single day scores low. Um, that's too much. Uh, the hands-on materials are to give a kid a sense of the concrete and the experiential. You take that and then you help the kids to steps of making it semi-abstract. And then when they have it in a semi-abstract way, you help them make the next step to, to it being far more abstract, yeah. okay? So that uh, you ground them in the physicalness so that they can really have models, pictures in their heads of what they're doing. But if that's all you do, then you never get them to the real abstract power of it all. So you gotta leave the materials at some point and help them, uh, to each step of making the concepts, of having to master the concepts in its abstract form, which is the way the concepts are really powerful. But the concepts aren't powerful unless kids really have physical models in their head of what they're doing. So you ground them in that, but you don't stay with that every single day. At some point you leave it and you start the process of abstracting it. So if a classroom were doing manipulatives every single day, yeah, there's something very wrong in that class. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mr. Kramer, 
if you would get us a, the past four years gender information just so we can have a comparison we would appreciate it all right um dr keller to your uh, report on the challenge committee now to close please find uh, the challenge review report uh, the, the committee met twice uh, the superintendent met with the committee and uh, the model that was developed is a, we call a coordinator consultant approach to the classroom. The model's in line with our curriculum process. And what would happen is that next year in the fourth grade, we would operate in a similar fashion that we operated in the third grade this year. Those youngsters that come through the curriculum in various strands would be helped to get experiences in line with their talents. Uh, there are some details that have to be worked out, such as identification that starts next week, and a number of things that will uh, be in the plan, this is pro primarily conceptual, uh, by the time it starts. Uh, I personally think it could be highly successful and beneficial to a larger number of students and at the same time challenge those few who need to be challenged at the top. I just took a look at the resources for this program next year and I'd like to list the people that are going to help in this fourth grade and third grade endeavor. We have a director of gifted and talented, a full-time K-5 administrator, a curriculum director who's been with this committee all along, an integrated arts coordinator who taught the gifted before this program, three gifted teachers, two, three teachers of the gifted, all who, are all, <laughs> who are also gifted, <laughs> two of which will be working with the third and fourth grade, uh, an assistant principal uh, in the fourth grade who I spent a great deal of time this afternoon with, a new math coordinator, uh, Rachel, our math consultant, will be around, and our language arts coordinator. And in addition, a new fourth grade teacher who has been teaching gifted and talented in another community close by. Now the, the chair person of this committee are here and some of the committee is here. And if the board has any questions, we'll be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Uh, does the board have any comment or questions that they'd like to address at this time? <coughs> Mr. Greer? Um, I have several questions after going through the report and talking to some people who were involved in, in the implementation of the, re the report. My first concern was the staff resources to implement this, and that has been answered. Uh, I guess my next one would be the process um, of how we're going to assess. I mean, is this based on the program for assessment that's now in place supposedly in the third grade. I get a sense that that is not complete, that the, um, the third grade assessment from a new half-time essentially gifted talented uh, teacher this past year has not completed her, her goals or objectives. And as far as integration with the existing third grade teachers, that that there is only a language arts assessment in place and that there is no math assessment that bothers me. Um, one of the big things that bothers me is the big structural change that's taking place, the number of things that are taking place next year. One is the change from a K, K to five system with the integration of the fourth and fifth grade into the elementary fourth grade has only been in that system a couple of years, so we still have K 
fifth grade for children, how does this is a quite a while. Um, the, uh, the creation of a full-time principal and a new assistant principal and uh, where they're going to be in the curriculum development. Um, this, we're gonna have a new math coordinator who's coordinating K through eight. So I think he, and that's half time, so I think he's being stretched. Um, essentially, uh, where the K three <coughs> language arts coordinator is going to fit in and who's picking up the other, the fourth and fifth. Um, a half time to full time curriculum director, so there's a change from a formative department to final implementation of a whole school curriculum. Um, uh, is the staff development and training for the third grade already in place for that third grade? I just think, I think there's a lot going on. And Today I looked at a process for curriculum review and development, which has come out of Michael's first year of setting up a curriculum department and supposedly working towards a whole school curriculum. And this seems to be going foreign to how the, the position paper on implementing new changes in curriculum. Um, and starting entirely from scratch with a fourth grade implementation of gifted talented. Um, that position paper says that there are three phases to the implementation of any change in curriculum. The first one is a labeling the needs assessment. I believe the curriculum committee has filled that purpose, which can take anywhere from a year to a year and a half. The next phase is adapting the new ideas. And when you adapt the new ideas, you don't throw out the existing, but you integrate them in with the new possible ways of, of changing the curriculum. Um, and in that involves uh, an education and uh, of, the, of the teachers. I just, I, I get a very sense that there's a lot going on. I'm not against the, the, the integration of the gifted talented into regular classroom, I wanna see that. I wanna see those, those, t those techniques to help stimulate and to benefit the majority of our population. Is there any specific thing you want Dr. Pelletier to address the assessment? Or, or How he feel, well first the assessment. I mean if there's nothing really in place at this 11th hour, how are we going to suddenly start assessing all these third graders? Well, we, we had a lengthy discussion today. Uh, I think, first of all, this is in line with Michael's process. Uh, the third grade experiment this year, while it hasn't been fully assessed, and I'll let Barbara speak to that in a few minutes, is uh, we referred to as stirring the ideas. Uh, we changed the label because we didn't like the, the word. I think toward the, in the last three months in the third grade experimental project that we're starting to see how that could become a real reality. And uh, I can appreciate <coughs> that we're doing a number of things all over the school system. Uh, however, I can't help but feel with the kinds of resources that we have and the number of people who have worked on this model that we can make this extremely successful. My concern is we've only provided for a small percentage of youngsters who need to be challenged. Now, if we wait two or three years and walk into this in a slower fashion, we're losing some young people who could benefit. I would hope that the best of challenge is in the elementary classrooms in five years from now. And instead of a handful of youngsters benefiting from this, a large number would benefit. Now, I'm not concerned about that very small 2% that, you know, are going to be bored unless you do something really dramatic. And I suspect we can handle those. 
you know, we can tutor those youngsters, we can move them. And I have a feeling that when the middle school concept comes into some true reality, there are going to be opportunities there to do a host of things that we can't do in the elementary school. With teaming, uh, groupings that youngsters can go from one to another, there are a host of things and that gives them a year to do this. My concern is with the amount of change going on and the kind of staff development and that is one of the things we have a massive staff development program going. I hate to put it in the vernacular, but I think we're on a roll. And I think the community needed that. And I'd hate to see it slow up. I'd rather make a few mistakes along the way to get where we ought to be. Now that's a personal feeling. Now I'd let me try to get some of the people here who are down in the details to answer some of your questions. Are there any of the people on the committee that would like to uh, uh, address first uh, our, probably our third grade assessment, which is probably going on at the present time? That particular uh, matter, Charlie, we will, we're, Barbara and I are meeting with a couple of the staff in the morning to, to address the details of that assessment. It will, in essence, include a, a couple of components. One is an informal assessment using a checklist that has been used in the past um, by the classroom teachers. Uh, a second component will be the SRAs, which will be back from the publisher in a couple of three weeks, whereby we'll get a formal um, scoring, if you will, in language arts and mathematics, as well as an ability score in the, what we call the EAS, the Educational Ability Score. So that, and, and we're doing two components because, and this is more for your edification, in the regulations we are required to do both an informal and a formal assessment. And in thinking this through, we didn't want to just throw out some component and disregard the mandates of the state statutes and regulations. So that as we have discussed it, particularly Barbara and I, in terms of how we might put this together, we decided that we would use both the, the checklist format and the formal SRAs recently completed by the kids and the EAS, the abilities portion of that also. Um, there are some pieces that we really look forward to finishing up, and and uh, I think we've we we got a nice initiation of that this year with Sue Welch's work with the Pond Cove planning team, which is responsible for addressing some of the detail at the Pond Cove site in terms of language arts assessments <coughs> that is consistent with whole language preparation. Um, we won't complete that until next fall. Uh, however, the third grade children going up, we will have these two components and, and have pretty good information. Not very dissimilar from what we've had in the past couple of years for kids moving up to the fourth grade. So th those are our two assessment pieces at this point, and I think they're fairly substantial. Are you you're planning to uh, eliminate uh, the WISC test, the IQ test, and uh, if you are, uh, how does the uh, the EAS test correlate? Do the same thing or yeah correlate? Uh, I would ask Lyle to respond to that last one in terms of the technicality or the number, if you will, Peter. As I understand it, there's a pretty high correlation between the EAS and the WISC. Um, the answer to the first question is yes, we had essentially felt that this would would suffice. Uh, again, we're looking at the kids' um, performance now as much as we are testing scores, if you will. And so in our deliberations with the staff, it, that will have some major emphasis now. And we'll, we'll continue to do that as um, Michael's curriculum teams formalize the, the, the curriculum matters over the coming months. 
uh, as well as um, we begin to, to receive the benefit of the additional resources such as the math coordinator, Nancy's return in language arts, um, formal training for the staff in uh, third grade staff in the writing process, scoring, and so forth. Are you going to assess all the students? Yes, they have, we have to screen all students, and what that does for us, Peter, is it gets us a pool of youngsters. It gives us a, a screening um, view of kids who are, f um, let me say, eligible for review for more challenging components to their curriculum. It provides an eligibility pool, if you will, although I use that term advisedly now, or from this point on, because the essence of this thrust is to review more children and to seek to provide um, a broadened challenge for kids. Any other questions of, of Mr. Doerr while he's at the podium? Is there going to be somebody who is going to be the central coordinator? I, I see a lot of people, I, I counted 11 resource people. I mean, we have, a, we have a curriculum director, we have yourself who is director of special, special education and gifted, talented. We suddenly have the new principal. I mean, who's going, you, and you've got a third grade and a half time third grade um, gifted, talented coordinator, whatever you want to call That's her. That's K-3, incidentally. K -3, yeah. She's K-3 But I mean, position, she's going to be used in the fourth, correct? That's true. I mean, how can you extend a half-time person to be able to effectively help the, t the fourth grade teachers and to, to finish up what she hasn't completed in the third grade as far as training and, and mm -hmm. development? I mean, it's, it's, it's expecting a lot from from one person? It, that's a good question. It, it, if, if you remember from the um, con conceptual paper that we wrote, uh, it proposes that we extend that person's time. Uh, perhaps Daryl would want to speak to that more specifically because we did address it in the committee. And w I, I think we at the risk of putting Carol on the spot. I think we would fairly quickly move to extending that time commensurate with a need. Um, we are extending it for the fall. We want to, to take a look at that uh, fairly early on within, let's say, the first 30 days or six weeks or so in terms of uh, does that, did that extension of time fit the need? And if it doesn't, Daryl has said to us, we'll work that out. See, um, may I? We have three people. Uh, if the fourth grade isn't going to operate the way it did last year, then that individual can help the person that's been working in the third grade. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what the schedule is going to look like. They're working on that presently. But we think by extending an hour and using the other person to a certain degree that that'll be enough. However, if it isn't, you know, they're going to be at my door in 40 days or 30 days, and then we'll do the same thing we do when we have 28 in the fifth grade. You know, we come to the board and say, uh, we need more time or another person or we need to do this. I have a feeling that uh, we have a, a lot of energy there. There are three people, uh, plus all of these people who have been working on the intricacies uh, and as you can see, the superintendent's extremely interested in this. You see, I, I weigh it this way. Uh, we provided for the gifted in compliance to the state for a handful of fourth graders last year. Uh, that's kind of simple for me because when the assessment is made, I'm going to know uh, who those few selected youngsters are and where they are. I'm also going to know those youngsters who fall in the category that weren't serviced this year, who didn't want to be for a number of reasons. And uh, I can watch a handful, you know, from here, uh, a director of the gifted program is going to know that, the principals are going to know that, and more importantly, the teachers are going to know. 
in September, they have the following youngsters because they're sent in heterogeneously. And those youngsters are going to be earmarked. And we're going to expect that we're going to challenge those youngsters, I would say, equally as well as last year, if not better, and in different areas. Uh, so uh, I can't help but feel that uh, we're going to enrich the program significantly. I'll admit it's new. I think we'll probably make some mistakes. I think we made a few this year. I think you know, we found uh, there are ways to help teachers learn to use collaborative consultants. And uh, we're going to have to work on that. We may even have a day or so before school starts to help them on that. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy, but uh, I think uh, I'm very satisfied that I think it's going to work. Is it possible to summarize the position of the fourth grade teachers, the, one or who, the ones who are going to have to make this consultation collaboration model work? Are they ready for this? Are they for it? Well, uh, I'm just looking at the fourth grade teachers. The new one we're bringing aboard is trained in the area. Uh, I would say the majority, you know, from this point, are ready for this. I don't know, the people who work more closely with them, I think, who know them better, can answer that. But certainly, if I didn't feel they were ready, and we had the supervision, well, I want to get them ready first. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, let me ask people who live with them. Who uh, know the fourth grade teachers better than anyone? Let me just... Um, th then we can, perhaps Bob can help with that. But uh, on on the committee, Peter was a fourth grade teacher, um, and she, throughout the process, raised some very good questions about those kinds of matters. I certainly did not get the feeling anywhere through the process that she um, felt overwhelmed. She was interested, she was motivated, she was questioning, um, and I ha happened to have had the good opportunity of being in her classroom this year to see some of the things she personally is doing to extend children, uh, particularly in mathematics. Uh, I guess I'd have to say from my experience and the and the, in the conversations we've had, here is a person who can, in, who in fact is another resource uh, as a as a leader in in extending for kids and not being afraid to take the risk of asking a question of an administrator, for example, about ca can I receive some training or or um, I know about this, but I'd like to know more about that. I felt this was a very open person, and I also felt that she was fairly representative of that staff. But perhaps Barbara would want to elaborate on that. I can elaborate just to an extent, Peter, and that is that um, through my correspondence with the fourth grade team this year, this has been kind of a difficult spring for me because it seems like fourth and fifth grade are becoming more mine before other things ease up for me. So I've got to tell you, I haven't spent hours with the fourth grade team at this question. But I am in, in um, regular receipt of minutes of their various meetings and was delighted to see the other day that through my contacts with fourth grade team and their discussions that they had reached consensus that they're very interested in collaborative model. They are expected to provide the majority of programming for these very able children anyway and um, appear to be very interested in, in more understanding, certainly with a lot of questions, but in more understanding of what all this represents for them and, and welcoming of the challenge. Do you think they're ready for it next year? Do I think they're ready yes. for it next uh, year? Are they, are they ready to start exploring it or are they ready to put it in practice as a working model? Well, I think that um, as with any new program, Loretta, there's going to be some fleshing out period in the fall. There's no question. There's no question. Um, yet those folks are, are very motivated and very bright and capable and, and I think they're going to be the ones that help us solve a lot of the logistics that have to do with the incorporation of this, of this pilot. Did you find that happened this year in third grade with the, the same type of a model that it was slow in getting started but that it's securely in place now that the year's over? 
Um, it, it was an interesting process for us this year because, as, as Daryl indicated, one of the things we learned was, was we need to start off much sooner educating teachers about use of the consultant. Once that occurred uh, and word spread about how valuable this resource was to us, um, one teacher in particular who was dealing with some uh, particularly able math students made use immediately because there was a resource that she could turn to immediately. Um, the rest of the third grade, every third grade student in our school benefited enormously from the work of this consultant this year through some behind the scenes work, some collaborative work in the development of materials that extended significantly in both our health, health education units and in our social studies theme week project. So I can say to you without exception that every child in the third grade was touched by her work this year and was extended in ways that we had not ordinarily been prepared to extend. This might be more addressed to Wayne. Um, the development and use of the review team that's mentioned uh, in the report um, to make decisions about some children's needs and the type of program they receive. It, it talks about the classroom teacher and perhaps the parents making a referral to such a team. Is there going to be, um, how are the parents going to know about this and, and that they have this opportunity is, is the first part of my question. And, and the second is for the children in five through eight in which challenge will continue. I know of instances where kids have come into the system from other schools and haven't even known that a challenge program exists, let alone been tested for it. Is there some kind of communication that's going to happen that's going to be a little more effective maybe? Actually, Jan, you just answered your own question. I, I, it's a matter of communication. Um, in fact, um, several weeks ago, I had been talking with Mary Jo, I think, and, and we addressed that in terms of well, how, how will the parents know and, and, and even what, what might we say to them. And I drafted a, a rough letter, um, took it over, flew it through Chris's head, um, talked with Bob a, a bit about it. It would be that kind of communication which would describe the effort, the thrust, the emphasis in math um, and language arts and uh, in essence ask the parent for um, their view, the parents, their view of the child's strengths in those particular areas. Of course my vision is that X years down the road here, four or five perhaps, we would be able to, uh, we will be able to say uh, much the same thing to parents in terms of music, uh, motor skills, leadership, uh, sciences, but I think we, n we need to start out fairly carefully, we need to delineate fairly carefully in, in two major content areas. Uh, we also need to piggyback onto the successes we've had for some 11 or 12 years now through the efforts of uh, Marty, Ross and, uh, Marty Watts and Carolyn Ross. Um, so, so that's kind of the view of things. Barbara and I will um, uh, flesh out that communication uh, this summer. I expect we would be uh, moving that on to parents during the summer uh, because not only is it a good practice, of course, but uh, as a director of this kind of programming, I, I have that additional concern that we need to meet the mandates of Maine State law. And that's one of them, that parents have an input. I, the review team, I, I actually I believe that that is a more sensitive um, practice. That um, youngsters, uh, there, there is a, a conduit, if you will, for referral for children who uh, may have exceeded the presented curriculum in the classroom. And right now what we uh, have is a once a year process for assessment. And you either in or out. Um, I'd like to have uh, personally, uh, I'd like to have the, the parents more involved in the process of sitting down and, and describing their child as they see them. Um, 
much as we do in special education, the difference, and I want to emphasize this for staff who, who may be either viewing, listening, or sitting here, the difference is that we don't have all the legal trappings of special education, uh, which is quite complex and pretty comprehensive. But the review team is a place to uh, dialogue with professionals about a child's particular strengths. Uh, out of that uh, will um, result a, a written plan for addressing the strengths as assessed and perceived. And that's pretty different and I, I happen to think that's much more sensitive and uh, to each child. I think it's a good proposal. I'm pretty excited about it. I w I'd like to see some of that be contagious. <laughs> I'm for the concept. I really am. I, what bothers me is, is every fourth grade teacher ready between now and September to be able to implement that? And I have a third grader going into the fourth grade. If she should get one of those teachers who is kind of dragging his feet, I mean, my child is the one that's going to suffer if he doesn't utilize these resources. Uh, he. he he or she tries to stodgily perceive the way they've been teaching. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all the changes administratively that are going on and how it's going to impact when it's actually in place mm -hmm. and this on top of it, that's my concern. Yeah. Um, I share the same concern, Kelly. As an administrator, I share the same concern about every youngster in special education services. As an administrator, I, I view that kind of concern as my responsibility um, and as the principal's responsibility. In terms of teachers, to use your term, who may be dragging their feet, I personally don't know of any teachers in the fourth grade over there who by design would drag their feet. If, if we n know by late August uh, the number and which children uh, should be reviewed within the concepts described here um, for particular strengths and differentiation and different strategies and methodologies than Barbara, Nancy Hutton, myself, are administratively responsible for each of those kids in those classrooms. Claire Ruthenberg, the young lady at Pond Cove, who would be working with grade four, and uh, Carolyn Russ, whom everyone knows in that school, uh, would have those children, if you will, in their eligibility pool. And it is part of their responsibility to speak with those teachers individually about those children and to engage a, a dialogue around the matters of strength and strategies. And if at some point during the year, and that may be very soon or it may be later on, uh, that youngster begins to outrun the curriculum presented in the classroom outrun the extensions developed between the classroom teacher and the consultant, uh, that youngster would go to the review team. But they're also supposed to be integrating some of their techniques into the regular classroom also. That's true. So, I mean, for two half-time teachers, because Carol, I mean, um, Mrs. Russ is a half-time um, gifted talent, and she's also half-time special ed. That's right. So, I mean, there's still no full-time resource person there and the fourth grade that gets the new teacher who has the expertise and gifted talented they're at an advantage already did so you say advantage at an advantage yes. already because those 22 kids have that expertise mm -hmm. um, just a personal observation um, couple of the other teachers over there also have the advantage of having worked with a consultant in the classroom. Um, that consultant happened to have been a special educator 
who worked with uh, Nancy St. John uh, in the classroom every day. Uh, Nancy has considerable experience in shifting the strategies and methodologies for children. And what we're talking about here is the differentiation of, of presenting a curriculum. Um, the, the other teacher I, I mentioned earlier has the experience of differentiating, particularly in mathematics. And I've seen youngsters in that class utilize her learning centers. And uh, she's an additional strength. And an additional thing here is with those kinds of colleagues and peers uh, who spend time sharing, talking, discussing, um, that's one of the greatest gains you can get in public education. There's certainly enough literature to support that in the past uh, seven or eight years. I, I share the, the tentativeness, I think, that I hear from you, Charlie, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we'll be able to do this well. Also with the review team that, that's set up, it, it seems to me that Sometimes parents are hesitant if, they, if they're going to go into the classroom teacher or into the principal um, because they don't want to make it look like they're making trouble or whatever. But with the review team set up for the specific purpose of parents being able to say, I think my child needs more challenge in this area, and it comprises a number of different, of different staff people, I would think that that would alleviate the problem to a degree as well. Well, it does. Again, it's a, it's a review for individual children. And uh, from my 20 plus years of experience in the special education area, as soon as you open up an opportunity for parents to more formally talk about or discuss or dialogue about their children, uh, it, it takes on a, a sharing essence and as well as an accountability essence. Um, you're a parent, you have children in the school, you know that if you walk in and, and talk with your teacher about your youngster, uh, either in terms of strengths or needs, uh, you raise the level of awareness. I think that's a good process. I think that's what public schools are all about and should be. I think my concern is it's going to take 100% participation on all of those fourth grade teachers to make this work initially. And I just, I think there's a lot coming down administratively with, with new people that's going to make it difficult. And I, I hope those people aren't distracted while they're getting, getting adjusted to their new positions and what the tasks are going to be for each of those different positions. I think that's what's bothering me. Mm -hmm. I'm for the concept. And I don't want to see those truly gifted, talented kids, you know, who get into a particular classroom teacher who's not quite fully re receptive to this whole concept. And how are you going to get them oriented and trained to handle the additional stress of implementing you know, new curriculum ideas? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's Thank you, what William. bothers me. Yes. Uh, I think we're needing to make a decision as a board tonight whether we're ready to proceed with a new plan for fourth grade, which we have been given a uh, a framework for tonight. Um, last month's meeting, I think you have, you have some information about it. Um, we were you were to come back to us with some different proposed models, and we were going to address the different issues that would be brought up in these different models. And and, and I think we have one model that we have looked at, and uh, I think we need to make a decision if we're ready proceed with a new program at the fourth grade level or whether uh, it's too soon and I think that's something that we need to decide upon as a board tonight. No, I think we could specifically uh, uh, we could also conceivably have yet another workshop on but I think time is short for that uh, I certainly have a concern that we're you are coming back you the the committee are coming back with only one model 
and it's not fleshed out very much. And while I personally, having looked at the numbers and thought about the discussions we've had and looked at the literature, I'm convinced we're going in the right direction, but are we going too fast? And do we really have something that is going to work reasonably well next year? I think that's the key question. I think there is an issue that's more key than that, and that is, I don't think this is entirely, or for the most part even, an issue of uh, a program. I think it's an issue that deals with one, what I consider to be one of the most harmful educational practices that there is, and that's the labeling of children. And I think even if the process isn't perfect, we've got another 145 children moving through next year to spend even one more year picking 10 and saying you are gifted because you scored such and such on a test and the rest of the children who may have scored one point beneath that saying you are not, I think that's far more damaging. I, I think that that's a, a, a an awful thing to do to children at this age. I, we're talking about nine and ten year olds, kids that think they have the world by the, the tail and can be anything and, and, and to say to them, we think some of you are gifted and the rest of you are not. We're not saying at this point, we think you have this wonderful strength and we think you have this wonderful strength and you're terrific and, and this and that and the other. We're clumping them and it's a convenience for adults more than it is anything else. I, with my whole heart, <laughs> feel that we would be doing far more damage by allowing that to go on for one more year. I can't <laughs> Are there other comments? Yes, Michael. Mr. Toy. Um, I'd like to just take an opportunity to try again to address uh, Mr. Greer's concern about the readiness of the fourth grade. That's the teachers there to uh, adapt and adopt uh, the change. Uh, I'm going to digress just for a second. I've been here one year, and uh, this is my anniversary meeting, as a matter of fact. But uh, when I arrived last year, we were discussing another new program. It was the foreign language program. And there were major concerns about whether or not uh, we had a curriculum together, whether or not the fourth and fifth grade teachers were going to be able to uh, support it um, because it was going to be delivered in the classroom. Uh, there was major concern about the coordination. Um, and what we decided as an administration to do was to move very slowly and very carefully. Uh, we, we decided that foreign language at the elementary level was very important. And we did have to step back, as I recall, from going, starting at the K and moving right up. We've kind of, we went for a compromise. The history of one year has shown that we were able to accelerate the implementation of a very successful program simply because the fourth and the fifth grade teachers uh, were so behind it uh, that we didn't need what we considered to be the first um, grading period to train the teachers to uh, try to find out what we were going to need to implement it in grades four and five we were actually ready to go within 30 days and in that time we also went down to Connecticut to look at some exemplary programs um, we're also finding now in the middle school that our enrollments based on this successful program in the other grades uh, is skyrocketing and we are talking about having to actually increase uh, the positions for foreign language. Uh, now, I know they're not the same in terms of program, but I guess if that's an example of how ready teachers are to get behind a program which is going to help children um, and what it takes to do that, that's a perfect example of that. What I would say from what I know about the fourth grade teachers, um, that they will do everything they can to make a program which you folks feel is in the right direction and which the administrators feel is the direction to go in. And I would say that to basically trust your professionals, from your teachers to your middle administrators to your building administrators, 
and I guess most of all, trust your own instincts for what's best for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Uh, from the perspective of curriculum, um, I think part of what, part, maybe even a, the major piece of, of what drives the debate <coughs> is the whole perception that, that there are a, a body of kids that aren't being extended enough in the regular classroom. That somehow the regular classroom is just not meeting uh, the needs of some percentage of kids. Okay? Very much a core classroom curriculum issue, which, which I take a, an awful lot of interest in. <coughs> it's easy to make a bunch of assumptions about that statement, and I think I, I certainly speak for the majority of, of the parent concern that I've heard that you know, standards aren't high enough, our kids aren't extended enough in the regular classroom. And I think it's easy to say that, that when parents are saying that, they're talking about uh, a larger, a larger group of kids than 5% who get selected. And I think that's a very core issue. Certainly a very core issue when you look at the whole issue of curriculum. Um, one of the, two of the wonderful things about the proposal in front of you is that I think it brings teachers back into the whole issue of challenging and, challenging and extending kids. The, pres the, the present program hasn't been doing that. This really brings teachers back, back into the issue. And I think it very much, on number one, number two, I think it very much empowers parents, the proposal that's in front of you. If a teacher begins to get the sense that there are some kids who they're just not extending enough, then there's no longer a uh, kind of an onus of somehow the teacher isn't doing the job and they're inadequate. Now there's a resource in place for the teacher to come say absolutely legitimately without any fear of how it's going to look on their evaluation. I have these couple of kids and I don't think I'm extending them enough. You're the resource. Come in and give me a hand with this. <coughs> I think that's tremendously empowering. Exactly the kind of message we want to send to our, to our teachers. It takes, it invites them to make use of a service and tells them that we're really going to think highly of them if they do make use of the service. So they don't have to hide. You know, that maybe there's some kids that maybe whose needs aren't being met and encourages the process. When, when a child isn't being extended, sometimes that'll be picked up first by the teacher, and the teacher will know it before the parents. In another situation, it might be the parents who begin picking it up first. So whoever picks it up first could begin to raise the issue. It legitimizes that for teachers. It legitimizes it for parents. And so I think the whole first layer of the program in terms of service to teachers and service to the classroom uh, has the potential of serving a huge percentage of the kids in that classroom. And so you have a program whose vision is much, much greater. And we're looking, who knows, we're looking at 33% a, a of the kids, 50% of the kids, with some, some figure that's much larger than 5%. It's, and I think it's a fundamental issue. Now, now, when you do curriculum development, certainly one of the issues we look at in terms of all of our programming beyond whole language and, and, and uh, one of the things you look at in whole language or in whole math, uh, health program, which you'll be hearing more about from me next year, is the whole issue of differentiation. You know, and how do you, how does this program uh, adapt to meet, you know, that spectrum of, of abilities and talents in the classroom? Um, from the standpoint of curriculum, I, I, I think the whole issue of differentiation needs to be integrated with what we're trying to do in curriculum. And I very much would like to have the uh, resources of the gifted and talented staff aligned and integrated with what we're trying to do in program development and curriculum. Um, 
So yeah, I say the time is now. The time is right now. It's, it's not too soon. Uh, if this, what you have, what you also have there ready to be accommodated for is if the consultant and the teacher working together still can't extend things enough and that child is still not being served, then there's still the potential for doing over and above outside of the classroom for that child. But, but this program has the potential of uh, getting services to that child that isn't being extended enough whether beyond the 10 who get, who get picked. And it undoes all the dangers of labeling. And, and I just point out to you one, one last thing. Since you know I, uh, I uh, espouse, espouse Piaget every now and then. But, but according to the cognitive, uh, according to what we know about cognitive development, there is a cognitive leap that happens for kids somewhere between the ages of 10 and 12. When that happens between the ages of 10 and 12 is completely a maturational issue, independent of intelligence. Uh, when that cognitive leap happens, it happens any time in those years. It doesn't happen at the beginning of an academic year. When that starts happening, we need to provide some training for our teachers to stay open to that and not to sort of think they understand where a kid is because they know where they are in September. Because we're looking at, at three grades now, four, five, six, where things, according, according to what we know about cognitive maturation, things really are in flux. So we need a system that's really open to that. And that will involve some teacher training. Um, this empowers teachers in the process of who they're seeing in their classrooms. It empowers parents, as you see, is, as parents get a sense of how the classroom curriculum is meeting their kids' needs. Um, I say let's jump in and do it. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Holt. Thank you. So formal here tonight. <laughs> um, I'm not an educator. That probably doesn't come as any big surprise to most of you out there. Um, I think that some of the things that we've heard over the last year, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the 5%. And I was just sitting here listening to Barbara and Chris and Michael and Jan, and what we're really talking about is the 90%, not the 5% at one end of the spectrum that needs special education, or the 5% at the top that need another special form of education. But we're really, for the first time, I think, in the year that I've been on the school board, really concentrating on that 90% in the middle. And I think that the program that's been put together uh, Granted, it's been four or five weeks that they've been put under the gun, but I was one of those who waited three nights before the term paper was due before I did that. So I, I think that some of the finest work can be done, I would hope, within a short time frame. Uh, the teaching techniques that I've heard about the challenge program uh, that have been with a very small group of people uh, over the last several years in no doubt has been very beneficial in their education. And I think that those kind of techniques, if brought into the realm of the 90% of those that can take advantage of it, would have an enormous amount of impact. And I think we would take the challenge program one step further, and I think I said this last month, by challenging all the students in all our grades to do as well as they can and giving them the opportunity that just a few have had uh, over the last several years. And again, I, I want to remind people that what we're talking about here is a fourth grade program. The five, six, seven, and eight program is going to remain the same as it is right now, and this will be a phased program. And I would expect that those who are going to be supervising the program in the fourth grade next year to come back in a regular interval and keep us up to date on how things are progressing and to make sure that uh, we aren't uh, um, getting into areas that, uh, that are a problem. And that hopefully we'll hear this time next year the kind of comments uh, we heard from Chris about the language program, the foreign language program that we had similar hesitations last year about putting a program in um, so late at the end of the school year and not having the time over the summer to work on it and having such a, uh, an excellent report this year. And I, I really think that the time is right. Um, one of the things, the other things I've learned in the last year is educators, we can, uh, or those that are educators, can sometimes study things to death 
And I, uh, I think this is a case where to wait another year would be, as Jan said, detrimental to the 140 students that we have going from the third grade into the fourth grade. So I support the program. All right. All right. I do we need a vote just to continue with this or do we just accept it as it is and what what uh, if you don't vote I'm going to make the assumption the consensus is that we move on if you vote and you vote against it I'm not sure what I'm going to do I know that. I'm, to, <laughs> I know. I'm not sure Maybe how we got into this bridge, state but <laughs> stay in Russia I think we have to vote. I think we have to vote because the previous meeting said that you were going to come back yep. to us with something. You have now come back. Uh, I think we have to vote on it. All right. Okay, we have been presented with a challenge review report. Do I hear a motion for its acceptance for the, for the school year 1989-90? So moved. Do I, do I need the same one? <laughs> For the fourth grade only. <laughs> For the fourth grade only. Right. Do I hear a second to that motion? I second motion. Okay. I hear, I hear a second. All in favor of accepting this program, please raise your hand. All opposed. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Next, we will have uh, Dr. Pelletier again needs to talk with us uh, about an item about the career ladder. I uh, Just two items. You have a list of the people on the career ladder. Uh, I would like to have uh, a reception for those people and all of the people who made the career ladder early in September as a sort of a initiation to academia. And uh, I would present more of that in September. Uh, also, uh, we've been asked and uh, we passed out this evening uh, the percentages and levels of all of the people on the career ladder, and you have that in front of you, that, which I think you'll find interesting. Uh, first and lastly, I want to compliment the people uh, who have made uh, the various levels, and uh, I'm extremely pleased with the evaluations. And there are their names. There are quite a few this year. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pelletier. Next item, strategic planning. Uh, the uh, next item, I can hardly control my enthusiasm for uh, what I think is a perfect time again to move forward in some long-range planning. Now, the administrators have had one meeting to discuss this. Uh, we're planning a two-day workshop this summer, August 17th and 18th, uh, using uh, a human resource personnel, Blaine Hartford, who uh, has worked with business, GTE, Xerox, General Motors, a host of teachers, and uh, comes extremely well uh, recommended. We would like very much to have the board come to lunch and dinner on the 18th to share our day and a half work. And this would be the beginning of a roadmap or a plan for the next three to five years in terms of where we're going, what our goals are, what our objectives are, the strategies. And we would certainly expect your input as to after we make our review to you. Are you going to buy lunch and dinner? We buy the I'll lunch. I'll be there. <laughs> buy the lunch. So we're very hopeful that that day 18th August is free for you in the afternoon and the evening. I think it'd be a nice way for uh, all of us who are very new uh, to our jobs and to the community uh, to start with some strategic planning uh, and a roadmap. Okay, thank you very much. I will proceed on the agenda with the, the regular items for the evening. Uh, the first item is a citizen's discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who would like to speak to the school board tonight on an item that is not on the agenda? If not, I, I would like to change the fifth entry, which is a request by the 
on the agenda regarding the pre-kindergarten program by some concerned Cape Elizabeth parents. I, I, I'm going to move that up on the agenda because I think there are many people here who have waited patiently through a long discussion this evening. And so at, that, at this time, uh, we will open uh, the discussion for this request made by some parents. And, and to begin this part of, of our meeting tonight, I, I, I'm going to let Dr. Pelletier make an opening statement. And after he has uh, talked with us a few moments, then, then I, if there is a, a leader, they're certainly welcome to go to the uh, uh, podium first and identify themselves. And then we welcome any comments by, by anyone here this evening. We would ask that you <coughs> possibly limit your, your uh, individual speeches to you know, a reasonable amount of time, because <laughs> there are a lot of you here. Uh, so I'll begin with Dr. Pelletier's comments on, on this issue. This is an issue that we studied for two whole years, and our decision was to drop the pre-K. Now, that decision was based on a very hard look around the country as to what acceptable trends were in kindergarten entry and placement. The position statement of the National Association of Early Childhood Specialists in State Departments of Education is a report that we relied very heavily on and the most poignant statement in their very lengthy report that I have this evening. I have 15 copies I brought. It's a lengthy report for uh, those people who are uh, part of the program, whatever that's going to be. But I'm going to just read uh, one short paragraph uh, that I think is the essence of the report. Delaying children's entry into school and or segregating them into extra year classes actually labels children as failures at the outset of their school experience. These practices are simply subtle forms of retention. Not only is there a preponderance of evidence that there is no academic benefit from retention in its many forms, but there also appears to be threats to the social emotional development of the child subjected to such practices. The educational community and 40 states have gone along in this same vein. The educational community can no longer afford to ignore the consequences of policies and practices which have assigned the burden of responsibility to the child rather than the program. And we've successfully looked at that this year and that's exactly what's happened. Place the child at risk of failure, apathy towards school, and demoralization and fail to contribute to the quality of early childhood education. Now, we took this study very, very seriously and we checked all of the people who were doing the same thing. After we hear the presentation from the parents, I'd like to tell you how successful we think we've been uh, through the principal and what's happened and what are some major changes are. So, Madam Chairman, uh, I, would, I would ask that you allow the parents to speak, and then I'd like to have the principal report on what's happened to our kindergarten youngsters this year as they moved up the levels. All right. Th thank you for your report. Uh, it, it's now open to anyone from the audience that would like to. Please identify yourself. Um, I'd like to say good evening. My name is Betsy Souter. I'm here tonight, as are many others, um, to express my concern over this lack of the pre-kindergarten option. Um, because my husband's job prevents him from being here, I also represent him. Um, Phil and I are the parents of three girls, ages seven, five, and one year. Our oldest daughter, Nicole, who has just completed first grade, went through the pre-K pre two years ago. This was an invaluable experience for her. Both my husband and I believe that without the benefit of that extra year it would have been an overwhelming struggle for her had she been in first grade a year earlier. We now find ourselves in the position of having our middle child, Erica, age ready but lacking in social and emo emotional maturity because there is no longer an option in the public school system that we feel will accommodate her needs. We have chosen to send her to a private five-day program. Uh, we are representing 40 families um, despite the fact that there are only well, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe people could stand up who are here with this, for this whole thing. <laughs> um, and however many that are, I, I, we haven't taken a head count tonight. Um, 
the 30 families who have taken, or 30, I should say, 25, maybe, maybe 30, have, um, who have taken the time to come out tonight are here to show their support and also their concern that pre-K is no longer an option. These families represent a few of the following areas. Those who have already benefited from the pre-K experience, those who are immediate candidates for this option, those who have young children and will benefit in the next few years, and those who wish they had chosen the pre-K because their child may now be struggling in the present structure. Though each family have, has their personal and different reasons for wanting to see this program reinstated, we all agree with the philosophy of providing an additional developmental year. This additional year allows the child whose academic and cognitive skills may be right on target to grow in areas that are impossible to test. These are areas being self-esteem, self-worth, and how that child perceives him or herself. We as parents are concerned about our children as whole people, for that is what they are, people. And to say that they all should be pushed through together because they are chronologically the same age is, in my opinion, a grave mistake. They are as different from one another emotionally and developmentally at age five as all of us in this room are right now. Uh, we would like to say that we are very supportive of our school system and have, and the direction that it is taking, and have the utmost respect for its teachers. Anybody that can control a class of 18 to 20 kids in my book is a miracle worker, let alone teach them anything, um, and its administrators. Uh, we're not here to condemn, but rather to ask you as board members to be flexible and visionary enough to give us an option that we feel is extremely critical to the development of our children. There are 13 families that we know of who would be committed to placing their child in a pre-K class this next school year, and at least two more that we know of who would seriously consider this option. There are two families who have made commitments to private alternatives, and because of the, the short time frame here, have chosen to stay with their decision, but they fully support what we're here for tonight. Obviously, they wouldn't be sending their child to that place where they're putting them. Of the 13 families who would choose to support this option, at least six are choosing to pay for a five-day program to give their child the time they need to grow and mature. If in touching base with a rel relatively small percentage of the population of Cape Elizabeth, we have found what could be one session of a pre-K class, my question is how many more people are out there that we don't know about? Um, and to those who will be, I, I, I would like to thank, first of all, all of you for giving us the time to come up here and, and for listening to us and letting us say our piece. Um, and right now, I guess I will be yielding the floor to, we have um, people who want to speak. We also have others who have letters who have been given to us because of one reason or other they couldn't be here tonight, so they're reading them in their stead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sudi. Good evening. My name is Liz Weaver. I moved to Cape Elizabeth nearly a year ago with my husband Gary, his elderly father, and our three children, Ben, age eight, Ellen, age six, and Alex, who will turn five this <coughs> summer. I am here tonight to add my voice to those of other parents who are requesting the reinstatement of the pre-K option for developmentally young five-year-olds. My request that you reconsider pre-K, and that of my husband also, who's not able to be here, is based both on, the no on my knowledge of our youngest child's developmental readiness and on the experience of his older brother, another summer baby at Pond Cove this past year. Our third grader was in a whole language environment at his previous school, but whole language has not altered his need for extra time. This past year has been very difficult for him socially and emotionally. His academic performance remains stable, but his self-esteem took a nosedive, in spite of extra intervention on the part of James and his classroom teacher. With their support, we have decided to retain him in the third grade in order to, get, in order to give him time to mature and find his niche. Our middle child, a December baby and a girl, is blooming as a six-year-old kindergartner. No worries there. That brings me to the last child and the subject of this discussion. Alex, who turns five in August, spent this past year at Ledgemere. When we enrolled him last summer, 
we just assumed that when he turned five, he would enter kindergarten. But as the year progressed, we began to have doubts. Cognitively, he shows some readiness, but like his brother, he is emotionally young. Because of this, and because we feel that if he is pushed too soon, then he too will face his day of reckoning, we have decided to keep him out for another year. We understand that the pre-K program was eliminated in favor of accommodating children of a varying developmental levels within the whole language classroom. As a new policy, this is understandably somewhat experimental. Since our experience with our third, grade, third grader is that whole language does not offset social and emotional immaturity, I'm afraid we just, we just can't experiment with our youngest child. We just can't do that. Unfortunately, without a pre-K program, we have only two choices, sending him before we feel he's ready or paying for another year of private nursery school. Financially, this has not been an easy decision. Another year at Ledgemere was not part of the budget, and it will require some stretching. Nonetheless, our decision for an extra year for our son is firm, regardless of what this, this body may decide. But please know that if a pre-K option were available, we would use it. In the process of making this decision, I have spoken with parents who used the pre-K program when it, was, when it was available. I have also talked with other parents who have sent their children to another year of nursery school, primarily because in this past year the pre-K program wasn't available. I have yet to meet a parent who regrets the decision. All say that the extra time made all the difference in the world in their child's ability to fully and enjoy and participate in the richness that we in Cape Elizabeth enjoy in our, in our elementary school experience. This view is also supported by Dr. Richard Dwyron, Chief of Psychology at Maine Medical Center. Dr. Dwyron spoke to Cape Elizabeth parents recently and said that he believes some children do need extra time and that if they do, the earlier they get it, the better. So if a child's developmental youngness is clear to the parents before he or she enters kindergarten, then the ideal placement for that child would be one in which he immediately gets the extra time and also feels he is progressing in a series of more challenging steps each year without having to endure the difficulties of repeating a grade. For him or her, the pre-K option is ideal. I am here tonight because, like all parents, I want my child to have the best start possible, one that nurtures the person he is right now so that he can thrive in the many years of school that lie ahead. Please reinstate the pre-K program so that when the best start means an extra year to mature, then the opportunity to have it will be there for all the children who need it. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. I'm Sally Tamaro, and my husband is also here sitting in the audience. Um, as a member of the community with a boy who turns five this summer, I am also here to ask for the option of putting my child in an early K program. My son will be turning five chronologically, but not developmentally. Um, from my observation of his interaction with other children, he has difficulty getting into groups. He's a very polite, sensitive, and caring boy, but his attention span is very short. As an educator, I am a high school educator at the Gorham School System. I have done some research since I began this dilemma. Um, when I went to the orientation meeting um, for the uh, kindergarten here in Cape Elizabeth, Barbara Powers um, mentioned David Alkine. I was fortunate enough um, to listen to David Alkine speak last year um, in a system-wide workshop at the Gorham School System. I've also uh, read a few of his books, um, those that pertain to this uh, dilemma is The Hurried Child and Miseducation. He says, and I do quote from his book, Miseducation, the elementary school period beginning at ages five and six is the crisis period in the determination of whether a child's sense of industry will become more established than the child's sense of inferiority. During the elementary school period, children have to learn the work habits that will carry into adult life. 
into adult, um, getting to school on time, paying attention, doing a good job, neat job promptly are part of the sense of industry acquired at this time. On the other hand, if children experience excessive failure in efforts to meet the demands of schooling, their sense of inferiority of being less able than others will be enhanced. Then he also goes on further in the book to say, delaying entry into kindergarten is quite different from having the child held back once in school. Um, <clears throat> also from the educational leadership magazine that um, we receive at the school, it says approximately one in four of the very bright early school entrants was either below average in school or had to repeat a grade. Um, also from listening to my students talk um, in classes and um, to me, the sense of failure from repeating a grade follows the child through his or her school years. They repeatedly say, well, this so-and-so didn't graduate. They repeated in the first or second grade. So even though at that time it is the best decision and the parent has made that decision, the failure still follows them through there. Also in Education USA, the May 29, 1989 publication, um, there was a column that read, preschool education needs a national policy. So that there's something that they are considering. Um, it was mentioned to me from, by an educator to read the book Summer Babies. Um, I didn't read it, but the person who gave me a short um, overview of it said it had the same theme in it as David Alcorn. I've also talked to many educators in the area um, to find out what they had offered for their opinion. Um, the principal at uh, Gorham High School um, comes from Yarmouth, and I also know um, many of the elementary school teachers there because I uh, grew up in Yarmouth, and they've gone back to teach in the system. They have a pre-K program and they have a transitional one program, <coughs> which have both been very successful. And they also, the particular elementary school teacher that I talked to knows my son, and she advised me um, where we don't have a pre-K program here to hold him out. Um, and in Buxton, I talked to our kindergarten teacher, <coughs> Diane Libby, and um, she explained to me the ramifications of the screening system and why um, the teachers there cannot um, give you any information other than that your child is developmentally ready for their system. And um, which I, uh, going into this, I did not have any idea um, what was going to happen. I figured that when, I, when they were screened that they would be able to tell me if he was ready or not. Not that he was just developmentally ready. Gorham um, has a pre-K program and I talked to the principal, Cindy O'Shea there, and they've based their program on the, Gazelle, on the information that they have gotten from the Gazelle Institute, <coughs> which she gave me the pamphlet to read, and they still have the same theme of a pre-K or a transitional one. Scarborough has a gold program, which is uh, a program that does, uh, uh, deals on developmental. Uh, South Portland has a plus five program. Um, I called a... Uh, uh, preschool teacher, uh, Sydney Rice, who um, owns the Stepping Stones Nursery School in Falmouth, and she gave me the information for Falmouth and Cumberland, and they both offer a pre-K pre program. She also said that um, Freeport and North Yarmouth have um, public preschool programs. And then my sister, who uh, teaches in Manchester Elementary School, who does not have a pre-K program, but does know my son very well, um, also suggested to me to hold my child out. But she did send me an article in the, um, that she uh, had, re had received, and it was um, from the Colorado Department of Education. And a quote from there was, age isn't necessarily the best guideline for deciding if your child is ready for kindergarten. And it even stated some guidelines to look at um, if you uh, wanted to make that decision. Um, I'd like to end with something that I read in a preschool graduation program that I just went to recently. Robert Fulgram, Minister Emeritus of the Edmonds Washington Unitarian Church. All I ever really needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. Most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. 
And as I said in the beginning, what I'm asking for is the option for a pre-K program, a public pre-K program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kamal. My name is Suzanne Reed, and my husband David and I live on Sawyer Road, and we've been in Cape Elizabeth 11 years now as homeowners. We have a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a three-year-old, and needless to say, um, are busy. And a little disappointed <laughs> because last year um, we had been so excited. Our children came late in life for us, and um, we were very excited about the pre-K pro program at Cape. We had heard so much about it, and we have two September children. And Davey turned five years old September 30th last year, and we were prepared to send him to the pre-K program for the same reasons the other mothers have cited. And found out when we went to the parent-teacher orientation, the first meeting, that the program was um, not going to be in effect last year. We also chose to send Davey to Ledgemere, which quite frankly has not been easy financially for us with all the other expenses we have to incur. But we felt it was that important for him and his development. And some of the feedback we've gotten from the teachers this year is, you know, Davey has just blossomed. Um, he's a little shy um, and just really came out of that shell and broke away from the family, so to speak, and had that time to work on those types of things and not worry so much about um, maybe curriculum type things or writing or he was a little slower in those. Um, we have, our daughter is ready for a pre-K program also, and we would uh, like to get that through the Cape Elizabeth system, if possible, and just would like your support in that, if you could. I also have a letter that I've been asked to read from uh, Pam Courtney, who couldn't be here this evening. Dear school board members, due to my daughter's birthday, I am unable to attend the June 13th school board meeting. My understanding is that the pre-kindergarten transitional first grade issues are to be discussed. I would like to express my strong views regarding these programs. I have a son who is completing his first year of kindergarten at Pond Cove. While he was still in nursery school, it became clear to me that he was a child that would benefit from an extra year's time to mature. Considering Pond Cove at that time provided pre-kindergarten, I assumed that it would be available for him to utilize. I made it clear at the kindergarten, kin kindergarten screening that we intended to use the program. It was at this point, late spring 1988, I learned that pre-K might not be, but was led to believe if it was dropped, a transitional first would be an option. It was because of this I chose not to send my son to an extra year of private nursery school. This was a comfort because financially that would have been a burden. I feel because I was misled, my son is now at great risk. My frustration is that I now have no choices when I really felt there would be choices. I feel robbed and dissatisfied with the way these decisions were made. It seems as though I was being pacified to keep me quiet until it was too late. I feel it was manipulative and shouldn't be allowed, and I hope my feelings are taken seriously for the sake of children coming into the school system in the future. Sincerely, Pam Courtney, mother of Joey Henriksen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Anastasoff. Uh, my wife, Brenda, and I have a child, son named Jason, who will be five in August. Jason will be going to a pre-K program in the fall. Uh, he will be going to the Cape Elizabeth pre-K if that is made available. Otherwise, we already have, have him registered at a private pre-K program at Ledgemere. What must be recognized tonight is the immense variability in the maturation rate of children in the same family, let alone the entire community. We have had experience with two daughters who went through the whole Cape Elizabeth school system from K right through to high school. Just to show you that Brenda and I are not making our decision based solely on chronological age only, let me give the example of daughter number two. Her birth date, October 14. The school recommended at that time not to start her in kindergarten. Their reason? She couldn't hop on one foot. We insisted that she start, 
and she did in fact start. She was always the youngest in her class. Every, every single year, she was always the youngest in her class. She's Jennifer Anastasov. For those of you who don't know Jennifer, she was the valedictorian in the Cape Elizabeth class of 1987. She was also a presidential scholar that year. By the way, she chose, she chose Georgetown University because it has no phys ed requirements. <laughs> <laughs> Now to Jason, how did Brenda and I arrive at our decision to place Jason in a pre-K program with great difficulty? Uh, one of our key inputs was the professional feedback that we received from the University of Maine Child Care Services where Jason has been since year one. You must recognize that it is a accredited program, nationally recognized, highly professional staff. And when they tell us point blank that Jason is not ready for kindergarten, we have to listen to them. They indicate that Jason is very bright, but they always put this but on this however. He's em emotionally immature. I've even had unsolicited feedback from even his, his gymnastics teacher. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned was self-esteem. One of the ways we've tried to build Jason's self-esteem is to put him into a gymnastics class at Cumberland County Gymnastics Center. The owner happens to be a previous teacher and he has quite the experience and without my, my even talking to him, he mentioned to me that, that Jason was immature, would not follow instructions, and if it, were for, if, 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 if it were he, he wouldn't put him in kindergarten. So, unsolicited feedback. I also want to use the process, the screening process that was used this year. We went through the Cape Elizabeth screening process. We went through the whole thing, the help of Barbara Powers, just as if we were going to enter Jason in the kindergarten class. And the following things I'm going to present to you are notes that I took from the teacher's input to us. And I welcome anybody on this board to read Jason's file. And if that is not legally permissible, I will give you the, the permission in writing to examine his file. Some of the comments from the teacher. He has particular problems with verbal memory. He needs lots of direction to keep his attention. He talks incessantly. Somehow there was a method of measuring it at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> right in the middle of the whole process, he turned off. In fact, the teacher mentioned that all of a sudden, all he did was take a blank piece of paper, took his hand, took a crayon, and decided to do the outline of his hand on the piece of paper. And you know, that was it. He was going to do his own thing. He also mentioned problems with developmental sounds, and when I tried getting into that, uh, he has what is called young talk. Now what I do, what I would ask you to do is at least, you know, one of you take a look at that file and ask, you know, if that were your child, would you put him in the private pre-K program or be up here asking for the board also to, to have one, you know, in as an option? And, and finally, but certainly not least, is our own gut instincts as parents. They tell us that Jason is just not ready for kindergarten. And please allow us the choice within the school system to go to pre-K. You still have the process and professional resources available to you. I know you're rather reticent at using names of people, identifying them as star teachers or whatnot. But with teachers like Debbie Johnson Pearson, who has excellent pre-K experience, with, with support people like Wayne Doerr and Jana Curran, Brenda and I would have no hesitation whatsoever to, if you reinstitute the pre-K program at the Cape, 
that we would re-register re, uh, re our son into the K program. This last page, I, there, there were feelings I had when I had discussions with the parents, and I didn't know whether I should bring it up because it's going to touch on some, some areas, but I felt as if if I didn't do it, then I would be missing out on what I call some social responsibility, and I would also consider myself spineless if I didn't mention it. And that was at the parents' meeting that we had last week. One lady mentioned that she could not send her child to a private pre-K program like the rest of us at that, at that meeting. She could not afford it. She was resigned to the fact that because of her financial situation, her child would be, could be repeating, in her mind, would be repeating the kindergarten twice and might suffer emotionally from the experience. I really dislike mentioning this, but isn't this some form of discrimination in Cape Elizabeth? I, I don't want to leave on that negative tone, though. All of us at that, at, at, at that parents' meeting, everybody I've talked to, we all share the great enthusiasm for the school system at Cape Elizabeth. We think it's the best in Maine. I bought in Cape Elizabeth in 1971 primarily on the quality of education here. I recommend Cape Elizabeth to those joining my company, moving from out of state. I recommend, and I tell them the reasons for you know that, uh, you know, not saying to that district or here and so forth. And that recommendation to date has been unqualified. And I, would, I wish it would remain that way. What's the extent of my commitment as a parent to education in Cape Elizabeth? I've already told Barbara Powers before that a tax cap movement in Cape Elizabeth would be successful o only over my dead body. And as I look at the group that you see over here, and in my speaking with them last week, I'm sure you'd find a lot of other bodies on that road along with me. What I would, again, what I want to communicate to you is that you have a very strong school system. We support you very heavily, and we appreciate having our input, the input of the individual, considering the student as an individual, is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anastasov, very much. Hi, my name is Patty Ramsey, and I'm here to read a letter written last year um, by a parent who had a child in the pre-K program when she first got wind of the idea of the disbandment of the pre-K. Um, I am writing this letter to express my concern with the possible disbandment of the pre-K program for Cape Elizabeth students. As a parent of one child currently enrolled in the pre-K program and the parent of another possible participant, I believe that I must speak out. I also believe that my first-hand experience gives credence to my views. I understand that one of the reasons for stopping the pre-K program may involve the changeover to a whole language approach to reading for first graders as well as kindergartners. In doing this, perhaps some children not yet fluent with letters and sounds can glide more easily into the reading process. However, the question still remains as to whether or not a child is mature enough for the first grade experience. I believe that changes in curricula would not serve the needs of a pre-K child. A pre-K child still needs time time to feel comfortable in a school setting, time to develop the ability to attend attentively to his instructors, time to create or modify social skills, and above all, time to be comfortable with himself. I fear for any child who participates in a class setting for which he is not ready. I would not wish the stress or the anxiety of potential failure on anyone. If the pre-kindergarten program were removed, the options that remain to a parent of a child not yet ready for kindergarten are few and distasteful. One, send the child to kindergarten. Two, enroll the child in a private five-plus program. Or three, keep the child at home until the following year. 
With the first option, besides the stress issue, there's the possibility of always playing catch up with classmates, bringing with it an innate feeling of inferiority. With the second possibility, the question is a matter of being able to afford private pre-K education, while there are other area towns wholeheartedly supporting their pre-K programs. The third alternative is a poor compromise. There would be four, few playmates around in his age group, and a child might perceive that he is in some way being punished by not being permitted to attend school. Everything is not perfect for a child in the pre-K program either, especially when the topic of moving on to first grade is discussed. It takes tact, warmth, and a strong belief in the pre-K experience to enable a parent to discuss this issue wisely with the child, to let him understand that he is one of the lucky ones to be given the time to grow into the school experience as nature intended. I cannot change my son. I cannot hasten his development. All will come in its own good time. I feel very fortunate that he has been able to have this extra year for himself. When I think about the next 17 years of schooling, at a minimum, that he has before him, an extra year is nothing, and yet it is everything. Please consider retaining the pre-K program. Sincerely, Kathy Clough. Thank you very much, Ms. Gramsci. My name is Lynn Wilcox, and I was asked to read this letter tonight on behalf of Gail Nappy to Cape Elizabeth School Board from Gail Nappy. I am very sorry that I cannot attend this meeting in person, but business and personal matters combine to make it impossible. <clears throat> the fact is I have waited an entire year to state my beliefs relative to a public pre-K program, as the parents of last year's potential class were never given that opportunity. As a former teacher of remedial reading classes, I can relate that my student groups were inevitably largely made up of children who were young for their grade. This was not coincidence, this was a fact. A somewhat lesser portion of my students were those who repeated the grade and maybe never came full circle to embrace school as a challenging adventure they felt qualified to meet. When did they really give up? Was it after repeating a grade? This is an educated conjecture. My point is that without a pre-K program geared to the developmentally younger children, the choice you give them may well be no choice at all. To be placed within an environment where you continually feel outgunned without the proper ammunition to compete is to guarantee a child who lacks in self-esteem. I believe most educators know that what a negative feedback that has created an individual. To repeat is to repeat a grade. It is to see your friends go on while you stay behind. To say that in kindergarten it doesn't matter, that nobody notices is not true. At least with this I'm sorry, some of it I can't. <laughs> At least where you're dealing with very competitive children. My son can still repeat the names of his friends who stayed behind from year to year, and every year he asks if he's going to stay back. Even if the fear is totally illogical, even if the child is doing very well, there is a stigma in repeating a grade at any age. Please accept this letter as my endorsement of the reinstating of the pre-K program as an option for the parents and children of the pending kindergarten class at Pond Cove. Since I have never met a parent of a younger child who regretted holding their child out or putting them in pre-K, I believe the experience speaks for itself. Unfortunately, I cannot say there are no regrets for these children who entered feeling too young or who repeated, and I have yet to meet one of those parents who would truly say that it did not matter. Thank you, Ms. Wilkins. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Brenda Anastasov, and I have been asked to read a letter from one of the parents who couldn't attend. As a parent of a son in kindergarten who was held back in this year, I would like to give my opinion on pre-K. Pre-K was an option for us when our son Chris entered Pond Cove, but at that time we felt it wasn't necessary. My husband and I both regret that decision. His first year in kindergarten was not a happy experience for him, which got worse as the year went on. He began displaying inappropriate behavior at school and was timed out almost daily. <clears throat> in January of that year, we began meeting with his teacher and other professionals on the staff to discuss possible retention. It was such a difficult decision for us to make. We were worried he might get bored repeating kindergarten, 
yet we were beginning to realize first grade would not be appropriate for him. We were told that a transitional first grade program was going to be formed for the year following and that even though it wouldn't be in place that September, maybe we could utilize some of its ideas when the kindergarten change took place in January. That helped us make our decision to retain Chris in kindergarten, knowing that he would be able to spend some of his afternoons in a transitional setting. When the change took place in January, the transitional first grade program idea had been dismissed and the inappropriateness of Chris spending his afternoons in a first grade class made us decide against it. He's had a wonderful kindergarten year this past year and is now truly ready to enter first grade. Both we and his teacher have seen such growth. He has such a love of school, which I feel wouldn't be there had he not been held back and given the extra time. I feel it's in this community's best interest to offer a pre-K program to its children. Parents should have the opportunity for such an option and for the extra time to grow. Thanks for listening. Michelle Gagne. Thank you. Santa stays on. Uh, Ms. Ferguson is leaving her one role for another <laughs> here. Um, I would like to um, express my point, uh, support for an option. I prefer the transitional first option, having gone through two pre-Ks and one uh, transitional first. A lot of, it was only in state at one year, so a lot of people never had any access to transitional first. Um, I feel it gives um, the child a full day experience where many of the children in two pre-KK, the half a day was too short for them. Uh, they're in contact with peers. Um, and I find the benefits of a, pre of a transitional first to be really very valid and um, would like to see it reinstated. However, I do feel strongly that if it wasn't that, if I, I, like I said, I prefer transitional first having gone through it in two pre-Ks for many reasons, but there still needs to be an option. Uh, I have two more children in the school system and one child who uh, will be coming to us this um, summer, and he'll be five in August, and already I can see that I'm going to be faced with the same decision that everybody else is saying, that if being a five-year-old child, uh, not five until August, and also being a foreign child with language barriers, uh, it is going, it's going to be a really tough decision. And I do not want to go into another nursery school experience with him. Again, I feel that kindergarten should be for everybody. Every child should be ready for kindergarten. I think it's in kindergarten you see whether or not they're ready for first grade. They grow during that year but they should be an option open to parents and not an option of nursery school, kindergarten. It's too hard of a decision to make and too financially hard for too many people. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ann Kerner. My husband Tim and I have three children, all of whom attended kindergarten at Cape. One's now a sophomore in the high school, one is in seventh grade in the middle school, and one is currently in kindergarten at Pond Cove. And it's about Seth, our youngest child, that I'd like to talk tonight. It's interesting following Leslie up. Seth arrived to our family from Korea on May 25, 1988. He was five in January of 1988, and when he joined our family in May, he was totally non-English speaking. By the time he came to us in May, of course, official pre-screening had passed. It wouldn't have really made any difference because Seth could understand a little of short phrases, but he never could have taken a pre-screening test. Before he came, I, t I met with Barbara Powers and, and tried to figure out what we'd be doing. And, and around that time, I heard that there was not going to be a pre-K. And I was angry and I was very frustrated because I thought it was an option that had been open to, that would be open to us that had not been open to our middle daughter, Elizabeth, who has an August birthday. She's always been young in her class. She's doing okay, but I was really looking forward to a pre-K. Well, that wasn't the case. Um, Seth was not tested before, before July or August. Um, he did go to the first visiting day for kindergarten kids he stood in the classroom by himself, was tried to draw into the group, 
but he was very shy, he was emotionally withdrawn, and very scared of strangers, and that's pretty understandable when you think he'd been in an orphanage for three years. Um, the options we had were to keep Seth out of school. We couldn't get him into a pre-K program because he came to us in May, and by May the pre-K programs, the private ones, are filled up. We decided that he really needed to be with children of his own age, and the only way to get him to do that was to put him in the K program. So with very careful placement and discussion with Barbara Powers and other administrators, Tim and I decided that we'd go ahead and we'd let Seth go to kindergarten, and it was a really hard decision to make. Um, we made a lot of visits to the school in the summer to get him comfortable with the setting. And he went off to school the first day. Uh, his teacher called me after an hour and said he was doing fine. He wasn't joining in, but he was doing fine. He was there. He wasn't crying. I was crying, but he was fine. <laughs> um, by Labor Day, Seth was able to speak in three-word phrases. He, he wasn't making sentences. He didn't use verbs. Um, he could express what he wanted and how he felt to us, to his family, and to people he knew and trusted. But aside from that, if he didn't know a person or he didn't know a situation, he was pretty quiet. Well, Seth has been in kindergarten all year, and there's been a phenomenal growth. And I have to say that he's right where he should be. Um, and I'm the first one to say that I'm real surprised about that. <coughs> he had a lot of help from his teacher, Debbie Jordan Pearson. He had help from Susie Safer, an ESL uh, coordinator. He had help within the class. He had the support of Wayne Doerr. He had the support of Barbara Powers and the administrators. We had some help um, from some people in Augusta who came down and suggested some language proficiency testing for Seth. We've been in very close contact with his teacher. His teacher's been in very close contact with us. Seth is a joiner. He's a beginning reader. He's in the thick of things. He plays Little League, and he doesn't stop talking. Um, the developmental year we were looking for Seth, we found in the kindergarten. If it hadn't been working, we would have taken him out. I'm not sure what we would have done, but we would have taken him out. Um, I guess I should have realized, thinking back, that if our middle daughter, our young daughter, made it through and she's exactly where she should be now, that it would probably be fine for Seth as well. But it was a little bit harder because he was a non-English speaking child and he was coming into a whole new world. and somehow the responsibility seemed a little bit even more overwhelming. I have to say that I too felt the frustration when there was not going to be a transitional first. I don't know if we would have used it, but I felt that it had been an option that had been mentioned that all of a sudden was no longer there and maybe the process of that decision making could have been a little different. But overall, Seth's placement this year has been perfect. His teacher was wonderful, his needs were fulfilled, and he really is ready for first grade. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Barbara Christensen. I'm a certified teacher currently teaching um, pre-K, or pre preschool, pardon me, and I have five children in Cape schools. Um, the validity of Dr. Pelletier's report is truly evidenced by a current middle school grade where 38% of the students were retained in some way either in pre-K or transitional first or at some other point. And children do grow at different levels or different rates and they will jump at some point. The children who are in this grade now have made that jump and it is causing more displacement for them because they are ready for junior high school and they are only a couple years away, still a couple years away. This has displaced kids who are supposed to be in the grade but who have not been retained. They're where they belong chronologically and they in turn have been pushed to grow up sooner because they have to be made to be where these other kids are. 
I also want to point out that there's a 33-month difference between the oldest and the youngest in this particular grade, which is a big difference. When you consider these kids are reaching puberty already, and they're, they're not even in junior high school. And they're with children and they're with 10 years old. Some are not 11 years old yet. And those kids are where they belong. I'd like to speak, my name is Janice Robinson. I wasn't asked what I felt about pre-K, and um, I have a son who went through pre-K. I have one that's in this grade right now. He came to me, he went through pre-K, came to me midway through kindergarten and said, Mom, I'm bored. He came to me midway through first grade and said, Mom, I'm bored. We're not doing enough. My child was kept back for all the wrong reasons. He was kept back because he was emotionally and socially not ready. He was academically ready. He could, he could probably be in the grade level he should be right now. He is adjusted well. He, he can fit in with the grade above himself now. He is physically capable of fitting in with the grade that he should be in. When, I, when people say to him, what's your name? He says, it's Brian. So how old are you? I'm eight. What grade are you in? Second, but I should be in third. That's the way he feels about it. It lowers their self-esteem. It really does. It does not necessarily raise their self-esteem. We need to give the kindergarten program at Cape a chance. My son, who is starting kindergarten in the fall, will not be five until the end of September. I trust the kindergarten program at Cape as it stands now. And I'd like you to give it a chance, too. It does work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Christensen. I'd like to submit a letter to you first before I speak from a Holly Reedy who would like it passed on directly to you. Thank you. Thank you. To the School Board of Education, Dr. Pelletier, my name is Sue McMullen. I am the mother of two and two-thirds children. No, three and two-thirds children. <laughs> <laughs> Show you where I am, right? <clears throat> One of whom um, was involved with the pre-K program and is now completing her first year um, in kindergarten. And then we have a child four years old who we are making our decision about for this coming year, etc., etc. And of course, this baby is not cooperating because this baby's due either August or September. So here we go again. Um, it's really not my style to be reading off a piece of paper, but I would like to at least start that way and then reiterate if I need to. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for listening. I know That's it's a our long job, process. and we're happy to do it. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I. I personally really appreciate the efforts that you all go through in making decisions, and I'm clear about the energies that go into that. Um, I'm a children's camp director and have 20 plus years of that kind of working with children and their development. So I come from a different aspect of it, but I'm appreciative of the educational aspect of it as well. <coughs> um, in my comments, I'm also representing my husband, Mark, and our children's grandparents who are also Cape Elizabeth residents. Um, as you can tell, for the, some of the people who are talking in favor of reinstating the pre-K program, we obviously are an enthusiastic, supportive group of professional people who feel very strongly about the whole child, not just the child as cognitive learners, as results of um, certain statistical analysis, but as whole children also. And I don't believe that one has to override the other. I think we can go hand in hand with that. Um, we do feel strongly that we as parents are co-parenting with our teachers, with our administrators. Um, we, we follow through with one another. The, our teachers have our children during the day. We have our children when the teachers don't have them or vice versa. So in a sense, we are co-parenting and feel strongly that we should have, we should be allies. We should be working together and at least be heard and have you understand where we stand and have everyone realize that we are in support of one another and not working against. So <clears throat> facts have been presented to you um, acknowledging the trends of the cognitive movement in, this, in the United States and also supporting, as Sally has presented, the balancing part of that, which is the facts that are of educators and professionals 
from all over the country who believe also in the extra year. Um, I am in support of each parent who has come up here and either talked for the pre-K program or against. I believe it is an individual decision. We can't make blanket statements as to what seems to be appropriate for some and not appropriate for others. That's why we are asking for the option of having this pre-K program reinstated. Not that it has to change the philosophy of our, of our school system. We don't want to. We're in support of what we're doing. We live in this community for one reason. Well, several reasons, but one of which is supporting our educational system. We don't want to override that. That's not where we are. We want to have the option, however, of having our young children, as we see them, be involved in the public schools. I, I am a public school supporter, and right now I have our Drew enrolled in a private pre-K program <coughs> because I feel strongly, and I guess I have to represent him, that he needs an extra year as evidenced by the experience that I have with my daughter who is feeling wonderful about herself now. And yes, she may leap in the eight, between the ages of 10 and 12 years old, but those are individual decisions that we have to make as parents as to what fits right when. And I would hate to see our middle child right now be put in a situation where he may not be able to keep up because he's just socially and emotionally not ready. It's the damage or the potential damage could be there for him. And that's risky business as far as I'm concerned as a parent. Um, wow, I've certainly lost my place here. Um, I feel that obviously, in my opinion, 30 plus people are pretty significant numbers in terms of families, not even people represented, but families represented who have a strong feeling about the option of being able to have an extra year. I think it's really too bad that um, the option is not there for us. Um, we sacrifice the state subsidy for the children who choose not to be here. And we also um, place anxiety on parents who want the options um, and don't have any place to go except for private school kinds of options, unless they choose a kindergarten program that may not be appropriate for their child at any given time. As I've said in the past already, I have the utmost respect for the time and the energies that have gone into the direction of our schools. Let us be flexible enough as one of the leading school systems in the state to be visionary in offering options to children who need the time. Please consider our request of the option for any given year. Let us continue with the nurturing program of the pre-kindergarten Help us as we look to you to help provide the needs of all children and to give the critical time to those younger beginners. Let's know that it's okay to have children continue in their beginning years to feel okay about themselves. Um, I just end with saying that I hope you understand where we stand. Many of you are parents and you do know what it's like to have a gut feeling and to want to be nurturing. And that's what we represent at this point with some facts to back us up, and maybe some visionary facts from some local educators that have been shared with me in terms of children who continue on their way if they don't catch up, what happens to them, what stress levels happen to them when they get to junior high school, high school levels in terms of drugs, in terms of alcohol, in terms of not being able to say no to peers, et cetera, et cetera. You're all real aware of that. Um, we look to you now for your initial reactions, and we hope that you would be able to make a decision on this request before the beginning of next year's school year so that many of us can make some decisions about whether our children will enter the Cape Elizabeth school system or not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McMullen. My name is Deborah Plummer and I have two kids presently in Pond Cove and uh, one going in in uh, the fall and another one that will be there in a couple years. It's about the one that's in first grade, who probably should have been in pre-K, but I wouldn't go for it because I just felt that it wasn't for him. And uh, I still feel that way. He wasn't, pre-K wasn't what he needed, but what he did need was a transitional first. <laughs> With everything that's gone through tonight, it's kind of tough, but we're holding him back this year. He doesn't like it now. 
and everything I listen to, it really gets my emotions going. But the point is, the option wasn't there for a transitional first, and the pre-K just didn't quite seem to make it because he'd been in preschool for so long. He's young, and therefore, developmentally, this is where it is. Maybe he'll make that leap, like she said, in going between 10 and 12. But right now, he's not ready. And second grade would be devastating. So, I know, every kid is different. My daughter is younger, chronologically, from, his, from her brother when she went into first grade in kindergarten. And she's perfectly ready. Maybe you can say that's boys and girls, but it doesn't matter. Every kid is different. But we need the option of either a transitional first or a pre-K. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Plum. <coughs> Are there any other people that would like to speak on the issue tonight? Ms. Stevens. Hi, I'm Judy Stevens. I have a son, Connor, who um, is five this weekend, and he in December, he goes, this is his second year at Ledgemere, and he's had two great years at Ledgemere. But, um, and I had assumed he would be in kindergarten this coming year, but in December, Joni Hewitt said, maybe I should think about not sending him to kindergarten because he's very, very bright, but just, you know, don't ask him to pick up a pencil and do any letters. He doesn't recognize all the alphabet and couldn't care less, filled with intellectual curiosity, but, you know, just not really ready to sit in circle time for more than about 10 minutes. And um, so I, fortunately, I called Maiden Cove <coughs> to, see, to see if I could get him on the list for 5 plus. And I was told at that time that there wouldn't be a problem. Fortunately, he was the last child <coughs> accepted because um, I had to kind of wait a month and leave an extra deposit with Ledgemere. I didn't want him in Ledgemere for three years. I think it's a perfect example of a child that's not ready for kindergarten. I really trust Joni Hewitt's advice. I myself realize that I, I feel it would put him at risk later on in first grade to ask him to start doing a lot of academic work. Maybe he'll make some great leap. I don't know. Um, but the point is that if there were a pre-K program, a good pre-K program here in Cape, he would be going to it in the fall. And since there isn't, and I really didn't want, I, I don't know about transitional first. I'm sure that there's a need for that with some kids. But I liked the option of a pre-K rather than have him feel that he was failing kindergarten by going into transitional first, that he wasn't, that he was being held back after he'd started school. So that's why when the, when the school called me in the spring and said, are you coming for a, a um, screening, I said, no, I'm not interested because uh, I really don't want him to be, to be in transitional first if kindergarten doesn't work out. So I can just say that I would have had him. I have three sons in college this coming year, and I could definitely have used the money that I'm going to be spending on Maiden Cove, and we would have put him in the pre-K program if there were one. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. My name is Beth Wexler. I have a first grader at Pond Cove, and I have a daughter, Joanna, who will be five September 5th. And I have her registered in the Maiden Cove 5 Plus program. And I just have a brief statement to make. I feel that it's a failure of the school system if their pre-K program was perceived as remedial or has evolved to have bad connotations. I had a, um, a Scarborough elementary teacher say to me last week, I can't believe a school that I've heard such wonderful things about that's as innovative as Pond Cove doesn't have a transitional program or a pre-K. Um, the 5 plus program at Maiden Cove is seen as something terribly innovative and exciting. Certainly, it will never, I don't think that anyone will consider that we held back Joanna in a remedial program. This is something that will be very stimulating and appropriate for a child who has been called a young bright by her preschool children, by her preschool teachers, a child that intellectually could have gone on to kindergarten but who was very young, I, youngest for two years in her preschool classes. 
a child who I saw hold back socially um, as compared to the other children. Yes, we could have sent her, but I feel that she really needs the extra year. And in a private pre-K program, I found something that I, I, I'm very excited about and I think will benefit her tremendously. However, if I felt there was a program at Pond Cove that would address her needs, that's where she would be. I believe in public education. I'm not happy about a third year of paying for nursery school. And I also, to echo something that was said before, I have heard that, that there were parents at the um, preschool screening who said, I'd love to give my child the extra year. I can't afford it. And I feel it is discriminating. I feel this is a well-to-do community. And maybe we're assuming that, OK, if there are people out there that want it, they can afford it. I think our school system should provide the option. And again, if there are parents who feel their children are ready, even if they aren't five until October 13th, that's fine. But for those of us who want the option, it should be provided as it is in so many communities in the greater Portland area and in Maine. Thank you, Ms. Wexler. There's some more comments? Sure. <laughs> Ms. Powers, I think we are going to ask you to give us a, a report on the year and how it's gone without the pre-K program, please. This is obviously an enormously emotional issue, and I hear from people's hearts as they speak that they are very sincere in their concern uh, in either direction. Barbara Christensen is as concerned as, as um, Susan McMullen and everyone else who took the time and come to speak to you, came to speak to you tonight. And I think the best I can do for you is, and I, and I apologize for some of you this is redundant, but I think, I think I'd like to go back a little bit and bring you through a history of why we are where we are, because you've, you're going to have to make a decision. And I'd like, especially on behalf of new board members, to sort of do a quick update for you. Uh, we would appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Um, one thing that really strikes me tonight is that um, in 1985, we would have had a similar turnout with, with the numbers flipped for those opposed to our pre-K program. This has been a program that's gone through a love-hate relationship with this community for a very long time. Um, when I first came to Pond Cove in 1985, uh, as a novice elementary person, my job was to learn and to sponge, to do everything I could to support staff. They had had a pre-K program in place for about three years, following an early childhood study where this had been the recommendation. That had been following years where there had been transitional first, transitional seconds, transitional first and pre-Ks to catch both ends, and it was this never-ending um, search of the right answer for children. Um, the, the transitional firsts and seconds had been discarded in favor of trying to do the most early intervention possible, which was the pre-kindergarten option, and it had been in place about three years when I arrived. At that point, um, it was under tremendous um, criticism from a lot of uh, equally articulate people in the community as those who are before you today. We spent an enormous amount of energy that year in 1985-86 defending the program. We didn't do a lot of curriculum work. We were just dabbling in whole language. Writing was getting off the ground. We spent a lot of time in defensive position, um, both from community and board, in terms of questions about pre-K. That was the year that I then had to step out for a year, and I ended up working for Dr. Pelletier and begin, beginning my teaching in third grade. Um, I, I, I said to myself, ultimately, uh, I hope to be back in an elementary administrative role, and I am going to do my homework so that next round, when we have to talk about early childhood programming for young children, I want to be better prepared to deal with more than intuition, more than feelings, um, really try to get into the body of research that had to be out there about transitional programming in young children. So I took a lot of time on that. Um, I identified national and regional conferences to attend in early childhood um, programming. I read everything I could get my hands on. And I was truly astonished to find no support for transitional programming. It wasn't there outside of the Gazelle Institute's work, large body of work, 
but through the Gazelle Institute was the enormous piece about maturationist view versus developmentalist view. I was truly surprised. I went to see David Elkind. I saw him in person. I asked the question. I hear you talking about hurried children. We're very proud to offer a pre-kindergarten program in Cape Elizabeth. Isn't that one way of dealing with these issues around children? And his answer was, I wish you'd deal with it through your curriculum versus, versus extra year program. It is the school's responsibility to deal with it through curriculum. Don't make the child be the one that's responsible for not being ready. Make the schools ready. I heard that repeated um, at the New England Kindergarten Conferences two years in a row. I heard Lillian Cates of the University of Illinois speak eloquently to the need to respect young children and to give those five, six, seven-year-old, eight-year-olds space to be who they are and to be successful within the format of regular education. Um, and to, again, own it as a school and not put it on to the children. Um, I read extensively and met uh, in Boston with Dr. Sam Mizell out of the University of Michigan, who's written a very expressive piece called um, High Stakes Testing in Kindergarten, where he is um, uh, urging the national early childhood educators to be very, very concerned about making decisions about young children's lives based on testing as five-year-olds. And that, in fact, um, what schools could be better doing with their resources rather than doing a lot of extra year programming is supporting small class size, supporting curriculum redevelopment, and, and allowing for the flexibility in programming that's respectful of young children. That was the message I got repeatedly. I've gotten it repeatedly at national ASCD conferences in both New Orleans and my most recent one in Orlando. It's a national theme. It's sort of summarized in the National Association of Early Childhood um, specialist State Departments of Ed that, that Daryl quoted from briefly with an extensive bibliography. Came back into Pond Cove that following year and, and started sharing some of this um, literature with staff. Red flags were coming up for us in terms of extra year programming. Um, the main kinds of emotions I was seeing from parents through this whole process of pre-kindergarten screening and the message that we thought extra time was needed and the ramifications down the line were very emotional. The two biggest producers of tears in my office to date have been, um, I just learned from your kindergarten screening there's that I know what you're saying, there's nothing wrong with my child, but you're telling me he needs an extra year and this hurts me deeply and an enormous emotion around that. I can't tell you uh, how touched I was but what families were going through by the message that somehow all wasn't right. No matter how professionally we phrased it and the professional people we had on that front line phrasing it, um, that somehow there was something wrong. Um, parents, fathers and mothers were often in enormous disagreement about whether or not to take the um, uh, a saying of the school, the, the um, ideas of the school, and there was a lot of, of fallout between families about what to do. I felt badly about that. Number one source of tears. Number two source of tears um, has been a little bit of what, of what the two speakers <coughs> talked about in terms of fifth grade and whatever, whatever, and that is children who are age appropriate, and especially after they get, well, it even can start in second year of kindergarten, but second, third, fourth grade, um, having to deal socially, emotionally with children who not only have caught up developmentally because they're a year older, but have now passed. And, and the gift of time, in too many cases, has turned into the gift of social dominance. And it's happening. It's happening out there. And it's not happening in every case, but it's happening enough that we've become very concerned. Um, one of the pieces of research that struck the staff and I the most was a piece done by Laurie Shepard and and her cohort Smith out at University of Arizona, um, who said that for all of these years where preschool educators and kindergarten educators have been trying to make really good decisions about young children and repeating them or doing extra year kindergarten or transitional ones or whatever, is that they see some immediate success. They see some immediate feedback from these children and therefore their decisions are reinforced. What they're not doing is the longitudinal studies. They're not watching what's happening down the line for these children. Um, and as a third grade teacher and a parent of a sixth grader, I've watched the kind of catching up 
that uh, Shepard and Smith uh, found to happen in their studies. Um, and, so, and so with all of that, the faculty took a really long, hard look at, at where our mission statement was, how we were representing to the community, that our job was to be respectful for all children and to provide for their needs, when in fact we were making some pretty categorical recommendations that, that were turning out to be fairly problematic, both in terms of some of our own experience and in terms of what national research was telling us. So we came to you after a very long and intense process that year. We piloted smaller class sizes. We allowed some people to make some decisions who had gone with painful pre-K decisions to bring their children back to regular K. They did it. Those children went on to first and were successful. The following year, which was last year, we opened, um, and with your blessing once again, we opened the possibility of, of another year of pre-K as a last year in this transition if there had been enough enrollment, and there simply wasn't. We needed a minimum of 13, and I think we had 9 or 10. So it was ended, and it was ended rather abruptly for those people, obviously, who were counting on it being there, and I hear them, I understand that. The notion of looking towards some transitional programming between kindergarten and first grade, very frankly, was turning out once again to put us in the position of doing some labeling we weren't comfortable with, but more importantly to me is the first grade teachers weren't sensing that it was necessary. The first grade teachers, interestingly enough, all along had been dealing with very young children, um, just six, who we might have put into a pre-K, whose parents all over the place were refusing the placement. So we, in fact, dealt with developmentally young fives and sixes in kindergarten and first grade for a very long time because their parents refused the pre-K recommendation. It sort of gave us a little indication that, oh, this, this, this is truly possible. So um, I might add that, that as I explained to parents in this transition process, one of the reasons that I can support it so ardently in face of nationally what's happening on in greater Portland area what's happening is that everybody who, and this is interesting because it's come up in several occasions in our interviews with potential kindergarten candidates coming from districts where there are pre-kindergartens or all-day kindergartens for the second year or T1s, that first grade barrier, that being the piece that caused their district to create extra U programming before first grade. At the same time we we're going through this whole process, our first grade was opening wide up in terms of becoming so appropriate developmentally. Um, both, not, and not just because of the whole language emphasis and the move away from basils and seat work and filling out lots of papers all the time, but in terms of math and science and everything we did in writing, the whole process of being respectful for young children and their learning was where we were. And it started to feel for us like where we wanted to be. The point of all of this is that, is that through the swings of parents' emotions, both um, if we had pre-K, uh, really upset that we had it, if we don't have it, upset that we don't have it. The school, in order to progress, needed to center itself and needed to have a sense of mission in how we felt about young children. And that's the process we've undertaken these last two years. We really feel very centered. We feel that we have been <coughs> appropriately responsive developmentally in kindergarten first, on into second, on into third. Um, our, our uh, hooking up with fourth and fifth grade is going to assure continued continuity in how we look at young children. And I think we owe age-appropriate children and that need to keep some age cohorts together that opportunity to happen because it's caused issues in the upper elementary grades that we never forecast. So it's our job, K-1, 2, 3, to be sure those children are successful. And I think it's been going beautifully. We have 520 children, and nine of them are repeating next year. Um, we have gone to a highly individual approach to considering retention. It can never be totally rolled out. Um, it's, it's based on a Lieberman model of, of uh, uh, making decisions around retention that are based on about 35 attributes of what does and doesn't make, make sense for folks. And when the process works well, it starts by about December or January and involves meetings and meetings and teachers attempting to do some changes in the classroom or some expectations or some parent partnership stuff to try to prevent it. And there were probably a dozen in process at some point throughout the year. I will say of those nine, two were direct parent request and didn't go through process. But the parents felt adamantly that this was necessary and so we have 
uh, conceded and will accept their recommendation. So really out of the 12, I'd say probably um, seven ended up uh, in retention. So I hear these people. I know that no matter where we are, somebody's going to be unhappy. Um, you're going to need to make a decision of whether or not you want this to be an option, and I'll support your decision, whatever it is. I'm just trying to tell you that as a school, for us to continue to, to make the gains we feel we've been making, we need, we need our mission clearly ahead of us. We're making decisions around curriculum based on the fact that we're going to have to be very responsive to children, and we're feeling really proud of that effort. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are, are there some questions that the board has of Mrs. Powers or any comments that they, they want to make in regard to this issue? Any questions for her right now? All right. All right. Would, are we ready to, to talk about this? Jump in. <laughs> Me? No, I'm the, I'm the chairman. I'm supposed to speak last. If I may, uh, I think that the, the parents who were here tonight spoke very eloquently about the need for pre-K. Um, I think on the other side of the, of the coin, uh, Barbara has spoke very eloquently, and I think there's a, a number of uh, research studies and, and things that have been out there that, that say that uh, we should be accepting children into the kindergarten program when they're uh, age ready. And I think that um, the two-year program that has been in place and the results that we've seen these last uh, two years and at the end of this year is, uh, is something that we should take into consideration as we, de as we determine whether or not we need a pre-K program. Mrs. Plummer, uh, I don't know if she's still here or not, but I think was uh, uh, concerned about retaining her child. It's a very difficult decision. It was one that we faced a couple of years ago. We had the option at one point in time of putting our child in a pre-K. We felt that it wasn't the right decision. The school acknowledged that. We allowed her to put in a kindergarten. She did well. We moved away and we wound up moving back halfway through my child's first year of school. School systems were completely different. My child wasn't ready and wasn't doing well in her second, second semester of the first grade. And we had to make the decision to retain her. I think it's worked out well. You know, you do what you think you can do at the time and, and hope that it works out uh, for the best. Um, developmentally, she's right for where she is right now. Um, I think that her skills are, are, have grown dramatically in this past year, and I think she's ready to go on in the fourth grade next year. Um, it's a difficult decision to retain. It's a difficult decision to determine, and she was an August child, so, and a late August child. So she was, in, she was five years old when she went into kindergarten. Uh, I think that we have to give, at least it's my feeling at this point, that we have to give the Pineco program as it currently exists. Um, more time to evaluate uh, its success. I feel comfortable about the direction that it's headed in. I think Barbara and her people have done an outstanding job. And I was around here in 1985 when we had rooms that were twice as full as this with people who were adamantly opposed to pre-K. So I've seen both ends of the spectrum at this point. And I would, uh, at this point, uh, continue to operate the kindergarten program the way it is. I also went through the same thing uh, John did, I'm not sure in precisely the same years, but in 1984, um, and um, had a perfectly dreadful experience with it, uh, as I recall. Um, I think that, that my sense uh, was that uh, we were trying to do a lot of sifting in for pre-K, K, K1, and, and 1, and we were just simply not carrying it off. And uh, some of the information that I've seen uh, since in the year that I've been on the board indicates, uh, and I think somebody referred to it, that we've actually identified some serious damage that has been done to certain groups of, uh, of children and uh, created a lot of problems down the line. I'm, I'm quite convinced of that uh, based on what I've, what I've seen and what I've heard. We are dedicating a tremendous amount of resources to uh, the elementary school. We have small classes. We have a lot of support for the teachers. Uh, and if we were going to go back to 
some other structure, increase the number of, of classes, uh, we would have to move toward, uh, we would not probably be able to increase the financial resources and that would mean creating homogeneous classes that would be somewhat larger uh, in order to provide a, uh, a pre-K and a K-1. At least that's my intuitive reaction to what I've, what I've heard. This is a fairly new subject to us and we haven't had any workshops on it. Uh, but I think that would create a, a significant problem. I'm pretty convinced that uh, we are meeting each child where he or she is and that uh, it can work and I I know anecdotal evidence is not really very uh, uh, significant, but tonight coming over here, I had dinner with my mother who's raised uh, four children and has uh, 16 grandchildren and six or seven great-grandchildren. And I asked her about this just casually, and she recalled her, her girlhood in, in rural Minnesota in a neighborhood in which uh, maybe a third maximum of the families were educated, a third were farming families, and a third were immigrants who didn't speak English, mostly from the Scandinavian countries. And they were all thrown into this rural school at age five, no matter what, and they all got along perfectly. And she recalled having seen over the years all sorts of trends in education. And I wish I could remember the names of the, uh, the authorities and the philosophers of education that she mentioned. I should have been taking notes. But, and she's quite an expert on certain types of education, particularly education of dyslectic children. And she was just aghast at the thought that we might move back to a lot of sophisticated testing in, as children entered the school system at age five as opposed to creating a system which had teachers trained to meet each child you know, where that child is. And I guess I agreed with her, which I don't always do. But uh, I, uh, my inclination is, unless we were going to go on and have a lot of workshops, would be that our present system is working and we have to give it a chance um, So I, I would find it hard at this moment to change it uh, uh, just based on what we've heard. And I must say in closing, and I'm taking too long on this, but I did uh, ask the uh, superintendent to make 15 copies of the document that was in our packet, and I think they're over there. And I do suggest that all of you, no matter which side of this issue you're on, I suggest you read it. Uh, it's, uh, and it has an extensive bibliography for you know, those who would want to go um, uh, deeper into the subject. Thank you. Yes. I reflect back about five years ago when my fifth grader was in first grade and we were confronted probably about April by the teacher that she was recommending retention of our son and he had been relatively progressing very well during the year but he was having some problems with reading. <coughs> and she felt that he was, he was doing so well that he didn't have his reading fundamentals down, that he would need them later on for all these other subjects that he was excelling in. And that she felt that if he was retained and given one year for developmental growth, because that's where she laid the problem at, that he would soar. Well, after a lot of reflection between my wife and myself, taking into consideration my child's personality, the type of, type of energy he put into things when he felt comfortable, and that was the key, how he felt comfortable about situations, that we felt that there had to be some other resource out there for us to, to deal with him so that he could go on. And if that was the one subject that he needed help in, then we had him tutored, and we did. We had him tutored for two summers. And on a one-to-one -one basis, he developed the confidence, he improved, and he went from essentially the low part of the reading group 
which at that time was Basil, to the top of the reading group. He got his confidence and, and he excelled. I think if we had retained him, knowing his personality, I think that he would have not soared like this particular teacher said he would. This was also before the, the institution of pre-K and the transitional one. That particular year, there was a very high percentage of retention. I think it, a lot of it was based on the type of curriculum and how the elementary school at that time was handling the total child. And, and I've seen in the last two years a total trend away from that and to treat each child starting in kindergarten as an individual and addressing those individuals' needs, whether they be de developmentally or whether they, they are academic. And I hope to see this trend continue on through the rest of the school system. So I would prefer to see it stay in place. <coughs> So I feel really sad that parents are being told that it's their child that's a problem because I don't believe that. If the child is having problems at that young age, I believe as Barbara Power said, there's something wrong with the program. And I truly believe that as parents, you have the right this next year if you choose to enroll your child in kindergarten here to hold the people responsible for what they have said they will do. They have said they will meet your child where your child is and, and support that. I think that that's the best choice, but I, I do think that, that you have the right to say, to go in and say if it's not happening, that you don't think it's happening and why. And and find out what the school has to say. But I think the school deserves the chance because Pond Cove is not the same place it was three or four years ago. I do believe they, they can accept the child where that child is and move them through the system. At many meetings that I've attended with teachers of older children, the comment is always made, please remember as you're talking about curriculum and programming that the children coming through will be younger. That is always kept in mind. I, I hope you'll give it a chance. And that leaves me. Uh, earlier this evening, you saw me vote against a program that, that was passed. And I voted against it because I don't think they're ready to put a program in place. And, uh, and I don't like to see us do programs that way. But I believe them about this program. I really believe them. I have gone in the classroom this year. I've observed how children of different abilities are working together. They're individualizing. I, I have seen it working and I do not see people hanging back and looking left out and being... I, I, could, I could no more pick out who should not be there because I think everybody should be there. It's the kind of program that's serving the needs of everyone. And I believe them, and I trust them, and I think the program is in place. And I think it's a good one, and I think it's solid. I got a letter from somebody I really respect, probably about as much as anybody I can think of. And this, per and this is a, a very strong letter in favor of pre-K. This person is an educator. And I want to read one sentence in this letter. It says, our eight-year-old son, and it gives his name, went through pre-kindergarten and is now in second grade. Although he questioned us frequently during pre-K and first grade about the wisdom of our decision, he doesn't mention it much anymore and I believe he has become comfortable with his second grade peers. I don't think this is a letter in favor of the pre-K program. It was meant to be, but I feel badly that a child for two years has been saying, now tell me again, why did I start a year late? Tell me again why, why I'm not with the friends that I was in preschool with. And I, I think this is an issue of trust. And, and, and the, you know, the ultimate decision will be yours. But I do believe in the program. I, I'm glad you came. And I think that will make us that much more on top of this program, questioning and looking and, and 
trying to be sure that, that they are doing right by all the students. But I also support discontinuing the pre-kindergarten the pre program as we have done this last year. And I, I believe I hear consensus on the part of this board. And, and it's not that we didn't hear you. It's that we do believe in the program that is in place and hope you will give it an opportunity to work for your children too. Thank you. All right, we're going to go on with other agenda items. <laughs> Madam Chairman? Yes, sir. Should we go to four, the consideration of superintendent's nomination of all new personnel? No, I think we should approve the minutes of the regular meeting okay. on May 9th. All right, has everyone read the minutes from, from last <coughs> yes, meeting? Yes, I move that the minutes. Yes. <laughs> I would move that the minutes of the last meeting be accepted. All right, all in favor of it was moved by John Holt that we accept the minutes, seconded by Charlie Greer. All in favor? And the business manager's report. This is not a scheduled quarterly report. Uh, we're in the process of closing the books, two and a half weeks. How do we look? Pretty good. We make it? Yeah, we make it. Yeah. Uh, as far as you know, year end, uh, Final figures, you're probably going to look at them in, uh, in August. Or possibly October, because the auditors should be done their reports by then. Okay. Could I say one? Yes. Sure. Um, I, I just want to say, since it's the end of the year, and, and in our this report, we usually go over, you know, we have the cafeteria report and so forth, that there are, are many workers in our schools that, that don't get recognized that I would like to thank for working so hard for the children, such as the cafeteria workers, bus drivers, janitors, um, and so forth, and, and, and just say thank you very much because it takes your efforts, too, to, to help keep the school system running. Thank you. I, I think you've expressed the sentiment of the board. Thank you. Um, but if you have any questions on the financials, I'll answer them. Everything you know, looks in place at this time. Most shortly in two and a half weeks. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. LaBelle. Dr. Pelletier? Yes. Uh, consideration of the superintendent's nominations for all new teachers for the school year. We've had to hire a large number of teachers. And first, I want to say that um, all of the betas are in each of your packages. This year, we've had something to our process. We've used a large teacher group, administrators, and a board member in interviewing for the staff. More importantly, we've had more applications this year for position openings than any other year in my tenure here. For all of the positions at the elementary level, we've received a videotape or have had a classroom observation, which has added another dimension to our process. Uh, the chairman of the board sat in on a numerous, or probably all of them, and uh, I think might want to say a little something about the quality of the personnel that are coming aboard. Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to. I, I believe I, I think we have 10 or 11, is 11 new teachers at this time at this that we, we're going to be uh, nominating and, and hopefully adopting this evening. But I, if anybody's still awake out there, <laughs> <laughs> if you're awake, you'll really be interested in this. Well, they have a uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to do, since I, I think I have met all of these personally, with maybe one exception, I want to tell you a little bit about each one of these new teachers, uh, just because I think it'll excite you about the possibilities for our school system next year. Uh, as Dr. Pelletier said, we really literally read hundreds of applications for these different positions. And uh, I think they came to us, the ones who came for interviews, the finalists in the process, had a lot of professional poise. Uh, in many instances, they were facing as many as nine educators, administrators, school board members there to interview them. And, uh, and then with the addition of either videos or actual classroom observations of them, we got a very good idea of how they were with kids. And um, let me tell you a little bit about the people that will be joining our school system next year. 
In the first grade, we have a lady by the name of Josephine Moran, who comes to us with five years of, of experience, three years in first grade. If you saw this lady walk down the street, you would say, she must be a first grade teacher. And if you would go in a classroom and see her in operation, it would be truly exactly what you had always hoped your first grade experience would be like. We're, we're so excited to be having her join our system. In third grade, we have a, a lady by the name of Ann Caliandro, who's coming to us from Brewster, New York, who has been teaching a third grade there. She has five years of experience and degrees from Wheelock and is about to receive a master's degree from Fordham. Uh, she came into our school system, had never seen the children before, and taught a very exciting lesson, knew the children by name, and, and really impressed us with her ability in the classroom as well as, as her interview, and we're very excited about having her in the third grade. We also have a lady by the name of Kelly Manahan who is coming to us with three years of experience from Ithaca, New York. Uh, she has a degree from the University of Maine with high distinction. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Ogden Williams is joining us in third grade also from Anchorage, Alaska, where he has been a teacher for five years, lived in Alaska for 10 years, uh, wants his own young family to grow up in Maine and is resettling here, uh, has traveled extensively in Europe and Africa and, and is presently uh, trying to get a children's book published, I remember reading on his resume. Uh, also in third grade, halftime third grade position and halftime math instructor or math coordinator, uh, Gary Record, who comes to us with 20 years of experience in elementary teaching, with a very strong math background in curriculum development. In fourth grade, we have a lady named Carolyn Sloan, who comes to us with 17 years of experience, education from Duke, Virginia, the University of North Carolina, strong background in reading and math. I spent an afternoon or a morning watching her teach in our school system and I, I spent all after she asked such open-ended questions of the children that I spent all afternoon trying to solve them myself. So that's the kind of, of uh, dimension I think that she's going to bring to our, our school system. In fifth grade, uh, a lady by the name of Annette Solabello comes to us with 14 years of experience, 10 years as a head teacher in a school where a supervising principal covers multi-schools. In fifth grade, a familiar name to you would be Jill Blackwood, who is presently in our system as a half-time special services teacher. She is now returning to the classroom full-time, with a strong liberal arts background, lots of travel, having lived in Bangkok, many places. It would be a strong contributor to our school system. Our Pond Cove librarian for next year will be Shari Anderson. Some of you may remember her as Mrs. Turner, who was the elementary librarian at Thomas Memorial Library until two years ago. Uh, I think anybody that ever knew her would know, would, would agree, it was, it's just a joy to have her back in Cape Elizabeth. In art, grades four through eight, another familiar name, Suzanne Terrian. Uh, she has been a visiting artist in our school system, wide range of experiences, everything from teaching art in the Peace Corps in Nigeria, uh, to director of the Wayne Fleet Summer Arts Program. In industrial arts, we have Randall Perkins, who has been an intern in our industrial arts department. Uh, so he's very familiar with our school system and already respected by the students and the staff. High school music, we have a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Donatelli, who is a cum laude graduate from the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, he has, I believe, Year, I think he has eight years of experience, uh, is presently teaching music in the state of Maine, and his stage bands and combos uh, just this year have won first in state competitions. Uh, very strong in musical production background, and, and uh, I think will add a dimension to our theater, theater arts program as well as our music. And I think that the music program is really on such strong footing with, with him in the music department working with Mr. Boffa at the middle school level. I hope you don't mind that I've taken the time to, to tell you a little about these people, but, but it's been, uh, I guess to say hundreds of hours is a little exaggeration, but it's been tens and tens of hours of careful screening and interviewing by many committees to, to come to a decision on these people, and, and our school system can only be stronger because of uh, this added manpower and woman power to our school system next year.
And at this time, the superintendent will be making nominations of these people for, the, for our school system. You want to uh, ombus the whole yes. thing uh, in due, yes. due to the time? Then I recommend that uh, all of the teachers be appointed by the board. Would you like to read your names? Do you have them? Josephine Moran, Anne Caliandro, Kelly Manahan, Ogden Williams, Gary Record, Carolyn Sloan, Annette Solabello, Jill Blackwood, Sherry Anderson, Susan Terrain, Randall Perkins, and Gilbert Donatelli. Okay, do I hear a motion that we so accept we'll these? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Leslie, <laughs> Mr. Holt. All in favor? All right. Consideration for leaves of absence? Yes, uh, I'd like to recommend leaves of absence for Deborah Cross, Margaret Beals for one year, and a half-time leave of absence for Elizabeth Wiley, English teacher at the high school, along with Susan Hobbs, a request for a one-year maternity leave of absence. All right, do I hear a motion that we accept these leaves of absences? So moved. Mrs. Solon moves and Mr. Leslie seconds. All in favor? All right, we have some dates to remember. June 16th, 1 o'clock, high school graduation. And our next board meeting will be August 22nd. There will not be a July board meeting, so it will be August 22nd. Is there any other business that the board? Yes, Madam Chairman. Yes. We have new, one new regulation from the state, and I'd like to have D uh, read the, the resolution. We need a board. We need a motion from the board allowing the superintendent of schools to make application and acceptance of federal funds for the 1989-90 fiscal year. That's for Chapter 1 money, Chapter 2, and all that. It's, so it's just from the Yes. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Yeah. Mr. Holt, Mr. Leslie, all in favor? Any other business? I'd like to know for our secretary how many seats are going to be needed for the graduation to make sure we'll have enough seats. There are six that have been reserved. One, two, three, four, five. Two. Two, six. All right. Connie? Sit in the back with the parents. <laughs> Any other business? All right, do I hear a motion for adjournment? Would you please? No. I move we adjourn. I second it. All in favor. Meeting is adjourned. The first month. We got to are we going into executive session? No. Okay, good. I just won by Emmy Lou and Kevin over the next.